I hope you know oh. every one of these presentations I've been eating. During. Excellent. All right, guys. Welcome back to Science of Diving, a fun, fun, and adventure-filled course. This is night three. This will um, with this group. Honestly, this will be the last night we need it, um, which is fantastic. It's uh, it's it's refreshing to have a group. But I want to say this is um, class, or is this class four? This is our fourth class, isn't it, guys? Is that a yes? We skipped class three. We skipped class oh yeah. Three. Okay, so this is class three. Okay, I was right. So class three, uh, three classes for a class to get through this as well as you guys did in, in three classes is extremely impressive. Um, so you guys did a fantastic job. So um, we've gone through quite a bit. We've gone through some decompression model already. We've we've talked a lot. Uh, we've talked to Arch Archimedes. We've gone through some Henry's Law, some Boyle's Law, some Gay Lussex. Um, we have uh, really kind of hit the gamut. We've talked equivalent narcotic depths a little bit. We've talked gas planning. Um, we've gone into a pretty deep um, – level of science of diving the, the ones i'm going to skip and i'm gonna let you read on your own on a, uh, honestly are going to be wave light and absorption um i they're interesting to their own but i honestly believe that you can probably read them just as well as i can uh tell them to you and you'll get just as much out of them so we're just going to jump right into it and, and what i'd like to do is just jump into the presentations um with chase uh, giving us uh decompression sickness and dive maladies if that would work for you absolutely Perfect. I will turn the screen over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Let's try this. All right. Let me know if you can see uh, the start or see my presentation. Yes. Awesome. Yep. So for anybody that doesn't already know me, my name is Chase Hartzell. Um, I've been diving, well, I got certified 25 years ago uh, when I was 14. Um, I was a Navy submariner, uh, similar to Brian, for about eight years. And then uh, I went ahead and got my bachelor's degree in physics. So this course, uh, Science of Diving, really seemed to mesh well with my interests. And uh, uh, it has not... Uh, Prove me wrong. I'm pretty happy with how it's gone. So uh, what I'm going to talk about, excuse me, what I'm going to talk about today is decompression sickness as well as other dive related maladies. Now, the first thing I want to do is caveat that this presentation is not all inclusive. Um, this is a topic that uh, we could talk about for six months if we wanted to. And, and frankly, uh, medical professionals spend years uh, researching this stuff. But this is really just to be a brief primer on the types of uh, dive maladies that we may encounter that would be unique to us um, as both divers and as uh, extended range or decompression divers. Um, you know, as we as we move forward in our, our dive education and dive career. So first off, the goals of this discussion is, is what I want you to be able to do is, is I want you to be able to list and describe some of these dive maladies and, and why they're significant to the deco or the extended range diver uh, or, or the divers that are starting to really learn and, and kind of push these boundaries of, of diving. Uh, and by that, I mean pushing the boundaries of these non-decompression limit tables. Um, we're going to talk about the categories of some of these conditions, and my goal here is to, to hopefully help you um, group these in your mind uh, so they're a little bit easier to identify if you do encounter these in the field. Um, I'll tell you right now, I was a former EMT, and the first time I ever encountered an actual uh, traumatic injury, um, I was not with a group of people. I was by myself and an individual had been hit by a semi truck, um, at low speed, but enough speed. Um, I knelt down to help the patient. I introduced myself. I said, Hey, I'm Chase Hartzell. I'm an EMT. And I promptly forgot everything that I was ever taught. So this kind of stuff takes practice. It takes memory and, and you're going to encounter something and you're gonna forget some of these things. Much like Ben has said, a lot of these are perishable skills uh, as well as this knowledge. And so the, the important thing is that you research it frequently enough and you discuss it. And if you can incorporate it into your pre-dive plan, uh, you have all the more chances of being successful. 
So the reason I want to discuss them in categories is hopefully it makes it a little bit easier uh, for you to identify potential uh, uh, issues that a diver may be experiencing. Um, we are going to focus a little bit on decompression sickness. This is a big aspect of diving. And as we go deeper and stay longer, uh, decompression sickness really becomes one of those maladies that, you know, as we become more skilled, we're less likely to have a barrow trauma because we're shooting up to the surface. As you develop those disciplines, those are less likely uh, to be your injuries uh, un unless there's an external force like getting wrapped around an SMB or uh, uh, some extenuating circumstance that is forcing you up against your will. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk a lot about decompression sickness. Uh, we're also going to touch on how do we diagnose these? What, you know, what, what are the signs and the symptoms that we can look for to help us, uh, in our response? And what does that first response look like? You know, if we can identify what a diver is experiencing and we can provide proper, uh, first response, uh, we're going to maximize the, cha the chances of that patient uh, succeeding and surviving. And then lastly, what I actually want to brief you guys on is secondary care. And this is one of the things that I don't feel like a lot of dive uh, videos and tutorials and, and YouTube videos really touch on is they'll describe the trauma. They'll describe the, the first response. But once a lot of people get to shore, do they really know what they're in for second to that? Um, and so we're going to briefly talk on that. And that's that's mainly going to be focused around decompression sickness. Um, so <clears throat> we got six real small chapters that we're going to talk about. The malady types, decompression sickness, diagnosis, treatment, follow-up, and conclusions. And, and, you know, please feel free to stop, ask me questions along the way, interrupt me, correct me. I'm always open to constructive criticism. Um, if... If you hear something that doesn't make sense or it's contrary to something else that you've heard, please let me know. And if it's something that it, uh, uh, we have a disagreement on, I would love to go research it and get back to you. So to start, this is me. When I was 14, I got certified as a junior open water diver. Uh, I got certified by a gentleman named Juan Carlos Villafana Murifano. Um, his name's long enough that it doesn't fit on my card. And he didn't speak a lot of English. So the quality of my dive training was not the best. Four days after I got certified, I had less than three hours of total dive time. My parents thought it would be a good idea to take me onto a decompression dive down to 131 feet seawater that had a 45 minute bottom time. Does anybody see anything wrong with this? And this is my actual dive log. I still have it. Get, throw something out. Tell me what you guys think. Like, what, what do you see wrong with this? What are the potential risks that I was exposed to? Well, I mean, the big one is that, you know, if you don't know that much about decompression dives and if your buoyancy control isn't that great, then you run the risk of blowing your deco stop, which is a pretty big no-no. Absolutely. How much, how much buoyancy and trim discipline do you think I had three hours into my dive career? Probably more than I have right now, but. <laughs> well, I really doubt that. I really doubt that. Um, I didn't know at the time just the kind of risk and the hazard that I had been put into. And then you know, I love my parents and I still dive with them if I can. Um, but I would not, I would not qualify this as a responsible dive. And I would imagine that very few instructors, if any would as well. Um, but it's Mexico and you can get away with a lot. So I survived fortunately. Um, but yeah, so first we're going to talk about our malady types. Okay. Do me a favor and shout out some maladies that we know of. I'd like everybody to at least tip in one. Brian, what do you got? I have a pen. Oh, sorry. So, um, and one that comes up is uh, nitrogen narcosis. Perfect. Nitrogen narcosis. Caleb, what about you? 
Can you hear me? My internet yep. was breaking up there. No okay. worries. Um, I mean, DCS. There was dissension diffraction. Say again? <laughs> yeah, I, what was that I just said DCS. Well, okay, yeah, perfect. DCS. It's obvious, but it's... Otherwise known as it. final DCS. Okay. <laughs> uh, Josh, you got anything? Uh, yeah, there's uh, pneumothorax. Yeah, there pneumothorax. Is. Absolutely. Okay. So like we said, we've got decompression illness syndrome, also known as decompression sickness. Uh, the nerds in hospitals like to call it DIS. Uh, the, for the rest of us, we call it DCS or the bends. So if you hear a doctor talking about DIS, uh, they're really talking about DCS, same thing. Okay, we got arterial gas embolism. Now, this is, this one's unique because it kind of, it falls within the realm of DCS, but it's kind of its own animal. It's, it's think of it as a subset or a, a unique category of DCS. Um Immersion induced pulmonary embolism. This is one that we haven't really talked about in our classes too much, but this has to do with uh, when the negative pressure inside your lungs becomes so great, either because of the work of breathing or it could be even a regulator malfunction that you're straining to pull air in to the point where you are now pulling blood through the, uh, the blood barrier and the alveoli. And so you begin to flood your own lungs and you drown your lungs um, from blood. We got nitrogen narcosis. We have oxygen toxicity. We have high pressure neurological syndrome. This is not one that I expect is going to affect any of us now, but it's still something good to know about. We have barotrauma. We have environmental conditions. And I just kind of group this one, um, as being in, you know, the water that we're in, the animals that we're around, the things that we're exposed to that are external of our our total dive system. This one's pretty unique. This is called compression arthralgia. And this one's unique to commercial divers or individuals that spend a lot of time uh, underwater. And what actually happens is they can begin to develop a form of arthritis due to the high pressure conditions that they're spending lots of time in. Now, if you're not saturation diving, likely this is not gonna affect any of us. But if you see your future, in saturation diving and some of these really technical dives, this might be something for you to consider. We're not going to really talk too much about that one here, though. And lastly, I want to talk about dysbaric osteonecrosis. So this is due to high pressures, you actually lose bone density. Um, again, this is one of those things that you're going to see affecting commercial divers and deep sea divers that are spending days to weeks under high, high pressure conditions not likely to affect us but the point i'm trying to make here is that there's a lot of uh types of injuries and diseases that are very unique to divers we're going to talk about the main ones though so how can we group these into some various categories to make it a little easier for us to remember well i kind of put them into barotrauma environmental and decompression now before anybody bites my head off on environmental you can see that gas toxicity is down there and this is a tough one because it's not a barotrauma, it's not a decompression, but it's a condition of the environment that you're in and the air that we're breathing is a part of the environment that we're in. And because this is directly coupled to the partial pressure that we may be experiencing, um, I felt it appropriate to put it under environmental. If it works better for you elsewhere, by all means, recategorize these as you see fit. The goal here is to show you that by grouping these into uh, simple categories, it will make it easier for you to identify during that initial phase of identifying a patient with a trauma. So barrow trauma, what does barrow mean? It means pressure, trauma means it's not a chronic condition. It's an acute condition that has the potential to be life-threatening. So pulmonary overexpansion is perhaps the, the, the first one that comes to mind. That comes from your individual who violates the first rule of diving, ding, 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 don't hold your breath, okay? Pneumothorax, this is really actually a pulmonary overexpansion condition, but there's a couple of different things that can happen when you hold your breath. Uh, mediastinal emphysema is one of them and subcutaneous emphysema. Um, these are really blood escaping from where it needs to be into the spaces where it needs to not be. 
and then it begins to cause complications. Environmental, we have hypothermia. We all know about hypothermia is when the temperature of our ambient surroundings is lower than our normal body temperature to the point where our body can no longer replace the heat to maintain homeostasis. The one we talk about less is hyperthermia. This is your heat stress, your heat stroke. Um, this one presents a little bit of a challenge to diagnose because we tend to be wet when we're diving. And so looking at somebody's ability to sweat or worse, not to sweat can be pretty hard to identify. Hypoxia, uh, a lack of the necessary gas to keep you alive. That is our oxygen. Uh, that is when we are not getting enough of it and our body begins to shut down. Gas toxicity, that can be oxygen toxicity, but it can also be other types of gases as we get into more exotic gases. Uh, hopefully, you know, well, I shouldn't say hopefully, chances are the gases that we are going to see are going to be limited to nitrogen, hydrogen, or helium, and uh, oxygen. If you are truly brave and want to venture into experimental diving, you may find yourself uh, toying with other gases. Additionally, some people do dive with argon inside their dry suit. Uh, a mislabeled bottle of argon uh, has the potential to cause some real problems for you. Um, venomous interactions. This is going to be our stingy pokey things underwater. Um, as somebody <coughs> who's been stung by both a Portuguese man of war and a stingray, um, this really is a good one to know and to understand how to react to. And then decompression really is going to be your decompression sickness and your arterial gas embolism. Okay, so let's talk about some DIS, DCS. Why should we, as more advanced divers, begin to have an elevated level of concern for DIS and DCS? Well, as we start pushing the limits of the non-decompression tables, or the dive tables, I should say, and we decide that we want to go deeper and go longer, we're going to start stepping outside of those non-decompression limits. Now, SSI has a set of Doppler limits that based on a study of the Doppler uh, diffused nitrogen or dissolved nitrogen in the body, they recommend uh, certain limits in their dive tables. However, as we move into more advanced diving, we begin to voluntarily exceed those limits with the understanding that additional decompression stops must be taken to prevent decompression illness. So what, what are the concepts of DCS? Well, DCS really occurs when the accumulated level of dissolved gases, and this is Henry's law that talks about the dissolved gases in a liquid. Uh, and this really does not just pertain to nitrogen. It's real easy to think that this pertains only to nitrogen, but it can absolutely pertain to other gases. Uh, like helium. Now, helium tends to be or is a lot faster uh, to dissolve into and both out of solution, and we call that perfusion um, and diffusion through the body and the lungs. Um, however, it does have a potential to uh, be a contributing issue with dissolved gases in DCS. Um, the other concept I really want to emphasize is that the theories that we use for tracking and managing dissolved gas accumulation is only a theory. And I'm speaking specifically of things like the Bullman ZHL 16C uh, uh, dive tables that we use. Everybody is different and everybody responds differently. And that's why we have things like gradient factors. Know your body, start conservative. And if you choose to expand your gradient factor limits, I would encourage you to start small and begin to work your way up. Now, to, to uh, uh, one of Ben's discussion points, uh, the Divers Accident net Network recommends that uh, you do not start with a low gradient factor below, I believe, 45. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Ben. Um, and the reason being is that there's some mixed studies that, that basically turns into what's called a pile stop or a deep stop. And there's some uh, studies. Go ahead. Jace, uh, Divers Alert Network. Thank you. Um, not <laughs> <Divers Alert. laughs> yeah, but yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, Forty-five, fifty is is exactly what they want. So you're you're doing good. I just want to correct. It's not Divers yeah. Accident Network. 
<laughs> Absolutely. I appreciate it. I misspoke. Um, and, and so, you know, the point is knowing about these and knowing how they affect you, it really is critical to your success and avoiding these decompression illnesses. So please understand that there are no absolutes in adhering to these theories, these decompression theories. It really is just a theory and everybody does respond differently. So me as a new decompression diver, I'm starting with very conservative limits. Now, if I accumulate as many dives as uh, Ben has in these kinds of conditions, I will likely begin to really understand what my body uh, manages well with, and I may expand my gradient factors. Um, but that, that is for each of you to, to decide. Um, and the third concept is that <clears throat> if you improperly manage and track your gas, this gas can build up to a point that it can actually cause organ failure and death. And we're going to talk about that. So gas embolism. This is uh, a condition that occurs when the gases, which tend to be nitrogen, that are dissolved in our blood, begin to fall out of solution and accumulate into bubbles. Now, when these gases are dissolved into our, our blood, we call them uh, bubble seeds. Uh, they have the makings of a bubble, but they have yet to germinate into an actual bubble. Now, if they do start developing into small enough bubbles because of the, reduce, the reduction in ambient pressure, we call them silent bubbles. They're not, yet, they're not yet causing any changes. We're not really feeling anything. And they still have the potential to escape our body um, through the blood barrier and our lungs. And we often use this to help us uh, decompress. And we call these silent bubbles. And they make their way out of the body. Now, if you have an accumulation of enough silent bubbles, uh, they will collect together to the point where they begin to restrict blood flow. And this is what we call symptomatic bubbles. And this is really what we're concerned about. And the most concerning of these is what we call arterial gas embolism or AGE. And the concern here is that as these bubbles travel through our blood system, our blood system is really mapped out very similar to um, being on a super highway and then getting off onto a highway and then going down a side street and then going down a neighborhood and then finally into somebody's driveway. They progressively get smaller as they feed the various components of our bodies. And they get small enough that a single bubble can actually obstruct blood flow. Now, what's so concerning about arterial gas embolism? If these bubbles are allowed to travel up to the brain, uh, they can restrict uh, uh, blood flow to the brain and create hypoxia at various tissue centers in our brain. Well, the brain is really, really sensitive to uh, uh, deprivation of oxygen, and it's possible for these cells to become injured or even die in as little as five minutes. And that's why often when you have arterial gas embolism, you see symptoms that really are very, very similar to a stroke. Honestly, an arterial gas embolism is a form of a stroke. So how do we diagnose the barotraumas, the environmentals, and the DCS or DIS? What are we looking for as we have patients coming out of the water uh, complaining of things? Well, let's look at barotrauma. Typically, we're going to see things that have respiratory components. Most often, we're going to see some type of shortness of breath. Um, and if it's bad enough where, where blood is uh, being pushed into the, uh, the lung, the respiratory cavity, um, you may see it actually accompanied by a pink frothy substance called sputum. Uh, the pink actually comes from blood in the lungs. Um, and it, it tends to be frothy because there is a, a gas, uh, you know, um, uh, dissolved gases that are begin beginning to come out. It, it's also frothy because you tend to see it accompanied by a lot of coughing and, and a raspy sound. Um, a headache is another uh, form of barotrauma. Now, I, I, I need to be clear here that barotrauma does not only refer to a reduction, a sudden reduction in pressure. Uh, barotrauma is also a increase in pressure, and we refer to this as squeeze. Um, for those of you who are shy to cold water and insist on wearing dry suits, Ben, um, squeeze occurs when uh, the pressure external of a 
air compartment is greater than the pressure inside that air compartment. So that can be uh, either your inner ear, that can be um, your goggles on your face, that can be the dry suit that's wrapped around you, that can be the glove between your dry suit uh, and, and your hand in that little compartment. And that's why dry suit wearers have these little hoses that run from their glove into the compartment of their dry suit so they can maintain uh, that, that pressure. Um, and then one of the ones that we're gonna talk about is tracheal deviation. Now this is, this is a unique one that provides really, really good information that somebody is having a lung issue and this tends to be a lung collapse. Uh, the deviated trachea occurs when the compartment that the lung is inside of, this is your inside your sternum, um, becomes punctured and air is allowed to go inside of that cavity. And what happens, the cavity around your lung is actually negatively pressurized. Uh, when your lung expands, you take a deep breath in, it's that negative pressure inside your lung cavity, uh, the area around your lung that's actually causing that lung to inflate. Now, if air is allowed to go in there, that lung can no longer inflate and the air has a tendency to collect inside that cavity and begins to push everything over to one side. And so what you see is if you, if you run your two fingers down your trachea or the patient's trachea, you will actually feel it moving away from the side of the collapsed lung. Um, this is always, always, always to be considered a life-threatening injury that needs immediately, immediate medical attention. So environmental conditions. Uh, let's talk about oxygen toxicity. We have shaking, irritability, convulsions, marine life, uh, tends to be localized pain. Uh, that can often spread to other areas, but it does tend to have a very localized pain. Things to watch out for here is allergic reactions and hives. Um, it is not uncommon for things that have venom uh, to induce some form of anaphylaxis. Hypothermia, you'll see violent shivering in the initial phase. Uh, you can even see cyanosis. The patient can still be conscious, um, but if you have enough loss of blood flow to extremities, because the blood's gonna naturally move to the interior of the body, it wants to protect the major organs. You know, you can lose an arm and live. It's a lot harder to lose a vital organ and live. And so you do tend to see cyanosis around the extremities, uh, numbness and tingling. Uh, if it allowed to go long enough, hypothermia can become uh, much more severe and the violent shivering will actually stop and your patient will become very comfortable and very confused. And that should draw additional concern. Hypoxia is basically, you're not getting the oxygen that you need to maintain homeostasis. So what do you see? You see confusion. Uh, you will see cyanosis as blood begins to turn blue. It struggles to replace the, uh, the CO2 that's built up with fresh oxygen um, and a lack of ability to communicate. And then hyperthermia, like I said, this is a hard one to diagnose. Um, what, what you can look for though is if the environmental conditions are really warm, you know, look, look at your patient. Are they wearing a seven mil wetsuit? Are they wearing a dry suit? Is the water above 90 degrees? You know, does it just seem like they're very, very hot? Are they rapidly breathing, shallow breaths, struggling to catch their breath? Um, what we would look for on dry land is profuse sweating would be the early stages of heat stress. If allowed to go unmitigated, it will progress into heat stroke, which then presents itself with discontinued sweating. Uh, heat stroke is a life-threatening condition. Um, <clears throat> and then followed by, or, or a lot of this is actually brought on by dehydration. And that's something that you can find by just pinching somebody's skin and looking how long does it take for that skin to return to a nice flat state. All right, decompression sickness, DCS, DIS. Okay, this is a big one. <clears throat> These, this list is not all inclusive. What I really tried to capture here is what you might see in a non-severe case of DCS. In a severe case of DCS, you're going to see a lot of trauma. You are going to have a patient that is really uncomfortable. They are clearly going to be writhing in pain. They're clearly going to be coughing up uh, quite a bit of blood. But it's the ones that are not real, not, not super uh, uh, heavy DCS conditions 
that I think are really important for us to identify to say, hey, we got to cut these dives. We need to get this person to a hospital before this progresses into something real bad. So what am I looking for? I'm looking for dizziness. Um, arterial gas embolism really is a form of a stroke. You can actually see face, facial paralysis known as Bell palsy paralysis. Um, you can see dizziness, confusion, an inability to speak, an inability to lift one arm. Uh, a, a, we look for non-symmetrical deviations of, of the body. So I'll ask a patient to squeeze both my hands with both of their hands. And if they can only squeeze one of my hands, that's leading me to believe that they have something going on in one of the hemispheres of their brain. If I see one dilated pupil, that tells me that something's going on on one side of the brain. So you're looking for those asymmetries of normal behavioral pattern, tingling sensation, uh, those bubbles that build up, the, uh, the silent bubbles that are turning into symptomatic bubbles, they have the potential to interfere with the central nervous system and they can actually cause uh, a slight tingling um, and, and like a tunnel vision uh, in the patient. So if the patient comes up and they says, well, you know, my fingers are kind of tingly, um, th that should start raising your awareness, uh, followed by numbness. A loss of feeling in extremities can be in, due to that inhibited blood flow as the those bubbles move to those smaller um, blood vessels, they can ob obstruct that blood flow. And you may actually even see cyanosis, that, that bluing in those extremities. So what does our treatment look like? Well, fortunately for us, a lot of that treatment is oxygen. Caveat, if you're qualified. So the first thing to do, inform the dive team if you are the one having symptoms. Symptomatic denial is a real thing that really costs people lives. Nobody wants to be the one that says, guys, we got to cut this dive trip short. I feel like I'm becoming symptomatic. Nobody wants to be that. That's a real pressure that we put on ourselves. And it is just absolutely unnecessary. If you are diving with anybody who, who holds that against you, you deserve to dive with better people. So you shouldn't be worried about hurting their feelings anyway. If you're not the patient, you want to stabilize that patient and provide oxygen if you are qualified and as necessary. Now, I say as necessary, but truth be told, providing oxygen, assuming that you know the proper rates to provide oxygen, is a pretty um, forgiving treatment. It does not cause, it does not have high risks if you're providing it properly and it has high benefits. So if you're unsure, and you're qualified to provide oxygen, just provide oxygen. Uh, this one gets overlooked in a lot of YouTube discussions and a lot of classes, I think. Document the times of the events, depths, and decompression stops that may have been missed. If you can get any of that information from your patient before they slip out of consciousness, this will greatly aid uh, the medical professionals that are helping, uh, that are gonna help and treat that patient. Be ready to provide AED and CPR support if necessary. Um, these are all things that you can get qualified during, in the, uh, SSI stress and rescue and react right course, or I think it's in the react right course, but they tend to be bundled together. Um, and then lastly, and most importantly, immediately seek medical care. Okay. What not to do? Don't deny your symptoms. It wastes valuable time that could be used to save your life. Do not attempt to recompress the, recompress the patient if you believe that there's been a decompression related uh, injury, immediately seek that medical care. The patient has a high likelihood of surviving if you can get them to a decompression chamber um, in, in the shortest period of time possible. The other thing about that though, is if you're diving one of these exotic locations, um, take the time to research where the nearest uh, 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 hyperbaric treatment facility might be. Uh, otherwise, you got to know that you're taking that risk. Now, when I was a kid and I was diving in Cozumel, Mexico on that big dive, I could have fit inside the decompression chamber just fine. However, my stepdad, who was my dive buddy, uh, his shoulders were so big, he would not be able to fit inside of the decompression chamber. And that was a risk that he knew and he was willing to take. All right. This one I'm just throwing in there because I've been stung before and a gross number of people have offered to urinate on me. Don't urinate on stinks. It's unnecessary and it's only going to cause infection and humiliation. 
please do not pee on me if you get see me get stung. Um, what you do with yourself is up to you. Um, and then lastly, please don't attempt to manage the issue yourself. Diving is a social activity. We rely on other each other. That's why we dive in buddy groups. Symptoms can often recede only to return with much greater severity. Anybody with a life-threatening allergic reaction knows about that. If the symptoms go away, it is not time to turn around and go continue your dives. Get that person to a medical facility. Okay, so what is secondary care gonna look like? Well, for hyperbarics, they're gonna recompress that, that patient and you're gonna be under close medical supervision. You'll go inside of a chamber where they're gonna re-simulate uh, a recompression. Now, uh, this tends to be uh, down to about 60 feet. And then this comes straight out of the Navy dive manual, which most medical and hyperbaric facilities use the US Navy dive manual. Um, I have a good friend of mine who is a underwater medical officer and hyperbaric uh, physician. And this is exactly what he sent me. Um, you can expect to be uh, recompressed at 100% oxygen down to a partial pressure of oxygen of 2.8. Now, any of you that have a nitrox certification, what is our limit for uh, oxygen partial pressure? 1.6. 1.6. Yep. So if you're looking at this and you're saying, well, why 2.8? Well, part of the reason that I'm giving this part of the presentation is if this is you and you're the patient, I don't want you to have to waste valuable time for the doctor to explain to you why 2.8 is okay. And the reason why is they're going to, they're going to saturate or they're going to uh, recompress you to a partial pressure of 2.8 for 20 minutes at a time. And then they're going to give you an air break at normal 21% oxygen for five minutes. And they're gonna cycle that on and off for the first three 20 minute intervals. Now, if a patient does begin to have signs and symptoms of oxygen toxicity, what's really nice about being in a hyperbaric chamber is they can very quickly reduce that level of oxygen and bring you back out. So if you did have a seizure under uh, that high partial pressure of oxygen, it's very easy to reverse very quickly. And there's a low likelihood of you drowning inside of a hyperbaric chamber. So what does that treatment duration look like? And it's, they say about four hours and 46 minutes. It can go longer depending upon how severe your decompression related injury was. But I just wanna give you an idea and a sense of what you may encounter if you have a DCS related accident and you need recompression. Um, if you want to look further into this, you can look at the U.S. Navy diving manual. Um, uh, reach out to me. I will certainly refer you to uh, where you need to go. And honestly, there's a good chance that you can go talk to the Idaho Falls Hyperbaric Center and ask them questions about it. All right. This is a quick it. question. Conclusions. I'm assuming yeah. I'm assuming anyone in the chamber with you is not breathing that level of oxygen. They're, they um, so must have another as we. Yeah. Um, what you might see is if it's a, if it's a true injury and um, a medical professional needs to go into the chamber with you, uh, they're going to be breathing the normal chamber atmosphere. Now here in the picture, you can see that the patient is, uh, I see that yeah. that mask is what's providing that, that higher partial pressure of oxygen. So again, that's why it's really easy. If that patient begins to exhibit signs of oxygen toxicity, they can remove that mask and very quickly recover that patient. It's a lot harder to do that when you're you know, 100 plus feet below the ocean or the yep, lake. Makes sense. So, all right. Um, this is your guys' opportunity to let me know what questions you have. Hopefully, uh, you walk away with this with, you know, those, those conclusions and you have a better sense of types of dive maladies you may either encounter personally or be present around and things that you can do that may help identify them and uh, what that proper treatment, that first that first treatment looks like. So um, this is your opportunity to ask me any questions. If you have any questions uh, or, or concerns or disagreements or anything, I welcome all comments. Do you happen to know um, how deep the uh, React uh, training goes into all of this as well as how to how to respond. Is it just the standard? I've done the 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 
standard stuff years and years ago. I don't know how deep that one goes though. So I, I'm going to refer you to Ben for that one because he's going to be able to speak to that better than I will. I have not taken the React right yet. I have finished the stress and rescue, but the React right I'm scheduled to take this next weekend. So I don't want to talk out of turn. I do know that there is a CPR qualification. I believe you learn how to use an AED as well as provide oxygen. But um, I, I really would rather refer you to Ben to make sure that you get an accurate answer. Hey, Chase, I'll, well, I'll put that in the parking lot. Why don't you go ahead and continue, and I've got that in, my, in the parking lot for you. Perfect. Well, uh, if there are any other questions or if there's no other questions, um, that is the end of my presentation, and uh, that covers uh, dive maladies and uh, decompression sickness. Very nicely Thanks. done. Thanks. How do you do? How do you do, guys? Good. Fantastic. You did really well. That was an awesome presentation. Absolutely. Thank you. Very nicely done. Very nicely. Chase, I sent you a couple text messages. I'll read them after the class. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. I cannot get rid of this cold. Okay. So the parking lot question was react, right? How deep does it go? Uh, it goes into more specifics when it comes to um, treating them as dive maladies versus just uh, first responder but it does cover a lot of general first responder stuff as well. Um, it gets you to the point where you're comfortable enough to use an AED in an emergency situation should you be a first responder, um, get comfortable enough to be able to put together um, and uh, put somebody on a cannula um, with a uh, with auction, as well as a basic first aid um, and a, a quick um, hands-only version of CPR um, with the idea of focusing uh, more on dive maladies as well. So. Um, usually, uh, in the shop, it's usually been about a three or four hour class. Um, uh, I can tell you that, uh, I have strongly encouraged Brett to turn that into a two, four, two, four hour classes. Um, and, uh, if you take it from either, uh, Aaron or, um, uh, Donnie, um, I think Josh would attest to that Donnie does a fantastic job of the, uh, react right course uh, but he's also a uh, a licensed and working emt which helps quite a bit um so um aaron just became a, uh, a react right instructor um the one you guys are going to take it from react right is going to be brett uh, certifying um several other instructors simultaneously so you get i think you're gonna get uh two or three instructors that are getting certified to be instructors in uh um uh, react right i'm an instructor in it um and while I tell you, I will tell you that I am proficient at it, and uh, I have a very good understanding. I can tell you that Donnie and and uh, um, Aaron teach a much deeper course than I do because that's the life they live. Um, I I teach above and beyond the course. They teach even deeper. It's it's fantastic, and they do a great job. So um, if you get a chance to take it, you should. Um, stress and uh, they've got the last part of stress and rescue coming up. Um, Caleb, are you interested in stress and rescue? Yes. At some point. Yes. Okay. That is a good course to take. And if, if you're on the path, I think you are, you, you're going to need it. Um, yeah. so, um, we, what we may do is see if there's another stress and rescue class, uh, enough students for a stress and rescue class. If I can get four students together, I will teach a four a stress and rescue class. Um, I, I don't prefer to teach it with less than four students. Um, it's just not as fun, um, to do, uh, for the students and not as much fun for me. I don't get to stress as many people out so you uh, i really need four so i'll tell you what i'll i'll put that on my my bucket list of uh stress and rescue and see if i can come up with four students so <coughs> excuse me so um there you go that's that's your basic idea so let's kind of jump, jump into decompression illness let's just kind of give a uh, uh, a basic idea so decompression illness really is your metastinal emphysemas your subcutaneous emphysemas your pneumothoraxes now the things to be aware of in terms of these types of decompression illnesses, right? These DCSs, DCIs, I mean, sorry, not DCS, DCIs. Let's be very clear. DCS is something different. Uh, these particular ones are very rare. Um, there's not ones, they're not ones that you're going to see all that often. Um, and uh, they're going to present in massive, uh, massive ways. For example, uh, subcutaneous emphysema is going to be crackling in the chest. It's going to be uh, just below the skin surface with bubbling, right? It's not something you're going to see very often. Um, a metastinal emphysema, you're going to see a massive um, uh, ch shift in the chest chamber, right? 
one of the chests, the chest is going to seem very off um, here. And, and it's going to seem very, uh, very odd. You're, you're going to have a lot of trouble breathing. Um, it's definitely going to be an odd thing. And pneumothorax, um, another one, a very, another, a very odd one to see on a dive boat um, as well. And, and typically that's going to present with a lot of symptomatic around the, the neck, you know, a big puffing around the neck. They're going to look like a dinosaur neck, right? Mm -hmm. Right around the neck. Um, it, you'll also see it puff in the lips, a lot of lip puffing and under the eyes as well as it's going in. And what it's doing at that point is you've got a lot of air in the tracheal cavity um, and the neck cavity pushing against the trachea, pushing against um, uh, the uh, throat, causing a, a reduction of valve breathing. All three of these really um, are very serious and very dangerous as well. The subcutaneous eczema um, isn't going to cause the, the type of breathing in, uh, issues that a metacymal emphysema or a pneumothorax is going to cause, but they're definitely going to be extremely concerning that if you see this on a dive boat. Now, oddly enough, um, things like metastinal emphysema and, and pneumothorax are fairly common when it comes to like car accidents. Um, they're fairly, uh, um, uh, pneumothorax is actually fairly common when it comes to um, uh, when somebody's getting knee surgery, for example, some sort of joint surgery or a knee replacement, um, ankle replacement. When they're going in that, that's it's a more common time to see that kind of thing. Now, the, the key to remember is each one has a different portion and a different uh, different presentations, you know, subcutaneous emphysema under the skin, that crackling, the crackling of the chest or the, the bubbling, right? It's where air has, has perforated the lung structure and it's coming out into the body in some way. And it's come, in this particular case, it's getting between the chest cavity and the skin, right? And, and I don't know why I need to touch myself to tell you this. <laughs> It's a really cool feeling if you ever get to feel it. It feels like crushing Rice Krispies under your fingers. Yeah, it's, exactly. And it's got that all crackly. Crackly. Yeah, it's all crackly. <laughs> that crackly thing to it, uh, right, idea. Uh, metal side of Zeev, that you've got a puncture, uh, puncture in the lung somehow, and it's causing air to leak out into the chest cavity. It is pushing the whole lung structure to one side. Now, here's the thing is that the only real way to treat that, truthfully, is needle decompression. You are not, and I just cannot stress this enough. Uh, I, I, if I have to make a little sign and we'll hold it up for the camera, I will do that if you need me to. But you are not certified in any way, shape, or form, and uh, without a tremendous amount more uh, cer certification to do a needle uh, needle decompression. I am not certified to do a needle decompression. I so was. What you do for each one of these is simply all the same. Um, you're going to put the, the victim on pure O. You're going to lay them down and re, uh, relax the stress. You're going to raise their legs and relax the stress. If you can, you're going to hydrate them. That's all you can do. And it's it's um, it's like putting a, uh, a Band-Aid on a sucking chest wound. It's really, it's mild at best and it, it, it will help possibly. But in the end, you need to get them to medical treatment now, not later, not, not um, what you... Uh, um, you feel like, but now, and so the signs and symptoms that everybody should recognize are pretty straightforward. If you see their neck puffing up, you should go, oh shit, right? Um, excuse my language. If you see their lips, you know, look like the size of the bee stings, you should say, oh crap. If you suddenly see somebody with a normal chest and it's all of a sudden shift over to one side, you should say, oh crap, right? And so the first aid for decompression illness and um, is very simple. It's it's lay them down, get them on oxygen, and get their their legs raised, and call nine one one. Call call the Coast Guard, whoever you can um, get there. And the only thing that oxygen is really doing is ensuring that the partial pressure of oxygen that's getting into their system is a is able to oxygenate out. Because at this point, they're going to have a reduced ability to uptake oxygen. They're going to uh, if their if their lungs are being crushed. They can only take in so much so much oxygen into the system to the hemoglobin barrier, right? If they're if they're uh, literally they're uh, choking, um, you know, to death, and you're able to get action, you can keep them alive a little bit longer because you're taking a higher percent of oxygen getting in there. So, be aware that this is really scary stuff. But the good news is, is most places that are dive related in Idaho Falls, not being a dive related spot, has four decompression chambers in Idaho Falls. So it's interesting enough and. And believe it or not, they use them often, not for dive injuries, but they use them often. So be aware that um, the only real sign uh, way to cure this is decompression chamber or needle decompression, right? And so as we kind of go through this process, it's 
it's important to kind of understand how that works. Um, another common uh, uh, malady that we see in um, dive mal uh, dive issues or causes dive issues, and it's it's hard to diagnose. It really is. It's called a patent form overlay oval um, or PFO. Um, and what this basically is is, as a child, uh, as an infant, we have a hole between the ventricles of our heart, right, um, allowing blood to pass. Um, it's a natural thing for when the baby's in the womb, but on about uh, 6% to 8% of all adults, that hole hasn't fully um, closed. It stays open. And as a general thumb, as we're, as we're walking along doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, through the, our daily lives, it isn't really an issue, right? It's not something that becomes a problem. Now, where it becomes a problem is where we start putting a tremendous amount of strain on our heart and, and as, we're di as we're diving. Now, one of the things most people don't realize is as we're diving along, all of a sudden we get to 33 feet. How many atmospheres is that, Josh? It's double the atmospheres. So yeah, two, two, two full atmospheres. Two atmospheres. So, Brian, if the air around us is now twice as thick, what does that do to the lung structure in our heart? So with it being twice as thick, I mean, basically – um, you're going to have more perfusion going in. And so there's, you're just going to have higher concentrations of dissolved gases in your bloodstream, right? We have that, but what's it, what's it doing to our heart? Um, is it making it work less or more? You're working more. Absolutely. Anybody ever remember that movie, the abyss, um, where he has to go out to get, fight the alien and he's got to breathe the liquid water <laughs> or liquid air. I mean, yes. Anybody, remember that? And it was a kind of a, I mean, well, it's kind of a complete BS, uh, you know, move that they're doing. This is not a thing, right? They're not but, putting diapers yeah. in liquid oxygen. Hang on. The mouse that they stuck in that, that was real. Yeah, that, no. but on people. It's no. a complete, it, yeah. It, yeah. This is not something that's happening or they're they're thinking about. This is, they're still in the, it's still, I mean, this, that was 30 years ago. Yeah. And that, they're still in the infancy and they're still, that's still not really a thing, right? There's but major they complications because you just get pneumonia <laughs> yeah absolutely so it does it's not really a thing but if you remember how hard it how hard it was to breathe and they're, they're talking about the idea it's going to be really hard to breathe and he's starting to get adjusted to it and all that part all that process that's you know think about it like that as the air gets thicker it's going to cause your heart and lungs to work harder it's going, you know it's, it's going to be more difficult to, to the process right and and as we put more strain and work on our heart they say the average 50 minute 60 foot dive is equal to a brisk to um, very brisk uh, walk uh, uh, for five miles. So as we start to do this, we're putting a lot more strain and pressure on the heart. And, and we all know the um, from you know, this basic dynamics of pressure that as you squeeze something, holes and things become bigger, right? We all seen the hole in the tire that when it got pressed on, the hole became bigger, right? It, or it, it shattered, something shattered because of a small hole. Or you've seen that chip, We even a uh, great example, we see the chip in our windshield when it gets a little water and it freezes, it causes expansion, it cracks, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what a patent formula hole of a light is, is that it's that little bitty hole in, in our heart that all of a sudden we're putting a lot of strain and pressure on. Well, if we put a lot of strain and pressure on the little bitty hole, it becomes... A bigger hole and a bigger, bigger hole. And it causes blood to be able to flow back and forth where it shouldn't be. <coughs> the good news is it can be fixed. Absolutely. But the bad news is, is most people don't know they have it. So it starts to simulate the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. Great chest pain, tre mm -hmm. um, hard tre uh, huge chest pressure, uh, difficulty breathing um, and whatnot. So um, that is definitely something that is fairly common that ha comes through that process as well. Um, that we need to kind of have a good understanding of. Um, as we go through this, I've got some videos um, that I like that I kind of think are fun little videos. And the, the first one is just kind of talking about how do the lungs work. So let's let's watch our little videos uh, here. I think they're good. If you don't like them, I won't show them again. But uh, I won't, at least I won't make you watch them again. How about that? <laughs> I like TED Talks. Many of us have hundreds of things on our minds at any moment, often struggling to keep track of everything we need to do. But fortunately, there's one important thing we don't have to worry about remembering. 
breathing. When you breathe, you transport oxygen to the body's cells to keep them working and clear your system of the carbon dioxide that this work generates. Breathing, in other words, keeps the body alive. So how do we accomplish this crucial and complex task without even thinking about it? The answer lies in our body's respiratory system. Like any machinery, it consists of specialized components and requires a trigger to start functioning. Here, the components are the structures and tissues making up the lungs, as well as the various other respiratory organs, the organs of the machine moving, we need the autonomic nervous system, our brain's unconscious control center for the vital functions. As the body prepares to take in oxygen-rich air, this system sends a signal to the muscles around your lungs, flattening the diaphragm and contracting the intercostal muscles between the ribs to create more space for the lungs to expand. Air then whooshes into your nose and mouth, through your trachea, and into the bronchi that split at the trachea's base, with one entering each lung. Like tree branches, these small tubes divide into thousands of tinier passages called bronchioles. It's tempting to think of the lung. Oh, can't hear anything. Ben, did you mute it? I can still hear you guys. Okay. At this point, the capillaries are packed with carbon dioxide and the air sacs are full of oxygen. But due to the basic process of diffusion, the molecules of each gas want to a place where there is a lower concentration of their kind. So as oxygen crosses over to the capillaries, the hemoglobin grabs it up, while the carbon dioxide is unloaded into the lungs. The oxygen-rich hemoglobin is then transported throughout the body via the bloodstream. But what do our lungs do with all that carbon dioxide? Exhale it, of course. The autonomic nervous system kicks in again, causing the diaphragm to ball up and the intercostal <coughs> carbon dioxide rich air is expelled and the cycle begins again. So that's how these spongy organs keep our bodies efficiently supplied with air. Lungs inhale and exhale between 15 and 25 times a minute, which amounts to an incredible 10,000 liters of air each day. That's a lot of work, but don't sweat it. Your lungs and your autonomic nervous system have got it covered. Kind of a fun little video. I, I, I definitely like the uh, um, the TED talks when, and uh, those little type of things. So, kind of some of the interesting things, you know, the air is delivered into our lung system. Um, and uh, uh, the first thing we need to understand, we talk about this a lot. We talk about the idea of using oxygen to flush the nitrogen out. Has anybody heard that in any of the classes up, yeah. to, up to this point? Oh, yeah. So, here's yeah. the thing to think about is that is not what is happening. Absolutely not that it's completely, it's an over, extreme oversimplification of what's really happening. We talk about this in tech diving, and this is where it really starts becoming a lot more important, um, is how we're processing and utilizing the nitrogen in our system um, in the process. So how, here's how it really works. Um, as we breathe in, we have something called the hemoglobin barrier, right? It, once it processes from the alveolar, uh, into the system, it goes through the hemoglobin barrier. And uh, God, <laughs> if there was a way to turn that off, I would have turned it off by now. Uh, there is a way to turn it off. Yeah, uh, if you I, just click on the little green icon in your top in your task bar. I don't have it all green. Okay, you I have a purple have one, though, right? You have a purple one. I have a purple one. Yes, I actually do. Click on the purple. Uh, At the very bottom, does it say reactions or close to the bottom? Nope, I got live camera, standard mic. Oh my God. Um, display. Yes, that's my link display monitor um, is what I'm looking at. Um, I'll just keep my hands down, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm going to call it voice isolation. Does that sound any better, by the way? I have to change it over to voice. voice isolation. All right. Well, neither here nor there. Uh, so as it goes, to, as we hit the hemoglobin barrier, the interesting part about this is because oxygen is binding. Uh, by uh, a binder, uh, 
it only allow it allows 10 percent of the oxygen to go through binding to the the white blood cells and they're transported through the, the process right um, um and so we're only allowing 10 percent of the oxygen to come through but we're allowing because nitrogen is a non-binder we're allowing 79 percent or 79 parts per hundred to flow through the system um into our extremities and as we start increasing that partial pressure the particles of nitrogen get less and less so as we're at 33 feet instead of we're allowing um uh, 79 parts per hundred we're now letting 158 parts or uh per hundred basically come through the system so our, our it's loading up our our uh, fastest little tissue compartments at 158 parts per hundred so it's it's over and it, as we get deeper and deeper and deeper that partial pressure becomes more and more and more the cell tissue can only hold so much partial pressure so much of this uh, until it gets to the point where it ha as it starts to come out, um, it comes out, it, it either bubble seeds, silent bubbles, or symptomatic bubbles. Okay, so that's what's happening. Now, when we breathe a higher percentage of oxygen, what we're doing is allowing a lower percentage of nitrogen to flow past the hemoglobin barrier into the system. So, for example, if we're going, well, let's just use an easy one. If we're breathing 90% oxygen and 10% nitrogen, we're only allowing 10 parts per 100 of nitrogen to come out, which our tissue system wants to be in equilibrium. So it will release it more easily. The nitrogen out of our tissue, as we, as we ascend the water column, it allows it to release more easily um, out mm -hmm. of the system. So it's only replacing it with 10 parts per hundred or at 33 feet, 20 parts per hundred or 66 feet, um, 30 parts per hundred versus the 158 or um, 223 uh, parts per hundred. So it's, re it's allowing it to be replaced with a much smaller percentage of the nitrogen. So that's kind of the interesting thing about how nitrogen really works. We talk about flushing it out, but it's not that we're, the auctions, um, it's not like a, a bottle of water with a, or a, that has half and half of um, Kool-Aid in it. We're, or we're taking a garden hose with water and putting it in and flushing out the, the Kool-Aid with fresh water. What we're doing is we're just putting in less Kool-Aid. That's the truth of the matter is. And so it's an oversimplification that we really kind of need to get the idea of that um, we're allowing less nitrogen in the system with by using a higher partial pressure of oxygen. So for example, this weekend, Josh and I were doing a deep class together or a deco or a, um, an extended range class together. And uh, as Josh will tell you, it was a very good class and we had a lot of fun and we learned a lot of stuff, but we'll, uh, there we go. <laughs> um, as we went through the process, Josh will tell you that we used a higher partial pressure of, of auction uh, or higher concentrated auction uh, to you for a deco blend. And what we were doing is not flushing the auction out, but we were um, utilizing a lower partial pressure of nitrogen to re-equalize our, our tissue compartment. So there's the more complex answer on what really happening. Um, so just be aware of that. Now, interesting enough, the cardiovascular system also has some interesting other pieces of this as well is as this ox everything this stuff goes in as it, it has to come out as well so as it's coming out of the tissue it comes out um in the form of bubble seeds silent bubbles symptomatic bubbles as they come out if those bubbles get too large that same cardiovascular or, uh, blood system that we've got going on with the white blood cells in there says wait a minute stop something's going wrong and uh, it it starts to send antibodies out to fight the things that should not be there. And that would be the bubbles. Now, interesting enough, AGEs and arterial gas embolisms and DCS fall in the same, um, under the same DCS, the um, uh, decompression sickness, right? Um, because they're both bubbles that are lodged into the bloodstream. And they cause a lot of similar problems um, where AGE becomes more, uh, uh, more, challenging is it tends to lodge itself and push itself more to the brain um, and cause more uh, larger issues, blockages of the heart, blockages of the brain. And it tends to be larger that way where uh, nitrogen tends to get lodged into other places um, as well. So interesting, interesting uh, process, the cardiovascular system and, and where it puts that and what's going on. So who would like to discuss and tell me what the three parts Three major components of the cardiovascular system are. Who can give me the first one? The heart. The heart is exactly right, Josh. Good job. Who can give me the second one? The arteries. The blood vessels. I'll take arteries. Um, 
the plumbing, and finally there's the third one. The pulmonary. But well, we already said the heart, the pump. The plumbing is the blood vessels. What's the transportation method? Would that be the oh, actual the blood? blood? The blood, yeah, the transportation medium. So the the three the cardiovascular system consists of three major components. And the way to think about it is we have the pump, something to push things through. We have the plumbing that some the things go into, and we have the thing in the pump, which would be the transportation system. By the way, that may be a test question. Um, so as we, um, and I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit through some of these, um, just so you guys don't get bored of it. Um, so one of the th things that Ch Chase touched upon is temperature and environmental condition. And one, one of the first ones we, we here in Idaho have a higher understanding from personal experience of is hypothermia. Now, interestingly enough, <coughs> um, Henry's law plays into fact with hypothermia as well. Caleb, how does hypothermia and Henry's law correlate? Oh boy, Henry's law. Um, Henry's law talks about a, a gas that is in a dissolved solution. A gas in a dissolved solution. Sorry, how, I'm trying to remember how. So, so a gas is dissolved in a solution based upon a few different things. Um, one of them is agitation. So how fast our heart is pumping, how fast the blood is moving. So which tells me that I will uptake nitrogen into my fast and slow tissue more quickly based upon my heart rate. So if I'm at 160 feet or, or 60 feet mm. or 90 feet, it doesn't really matter. If I'm at a mm. depth and I'm nervous or scared and I'm breathing fast, I'm going to uptake the nitrogen in the system faster. Mm. But how would hypothermia play into that? Hypothermia decreases your blood, your your heart rate, or at least it can. Um, so that well, hold on. In the early stages, it would increase. Mm -hmm. Correct. So you're going to have um, you're going to have increased uh, intake, and then uh, the heart can decrease after that. Okay. That's one thought. Absolutely. I see where you're going with that and, and you're not wrong. Um, here's the interesting thing is as things get colder, do they expand or contract? Contract. Exactly. Now, one of the interesting things is when I was racing a lot, I used to uh, race Wild Street and Street Outlaw um, in uh, the quarter mile quite a bit. One of the things we would do to get more and a better intake is we would get uh, bags of ice and we put them on the intake of our, our manifold. So we would mm. cool it down. So cooler air would go into the cylinders mm. and as cooler where air went in the cylinders, it was more dense and it would cause a better, uh, better compression to the process. Now mm. let's think about that for a minute. If we're able to cool the air and it becomes more dense, how would that affect with hyperthermia and gas intake into our system. You can fit more in it. Absolutely. That's exactly right, Josh. Good job. So as it, it, it's almost like you've heard this presentation before. <laughs> <laughs> Josh has been with me for a while now and heard a lot of my speeches. Um, I, you've got to be getting tired of them by now. Either that or I, uh, there's a picture of me on your wall, one or the other, I'm not sure. Um, and it, it may be on his dartboard. It's probably on his dartboard. <laughs> Get that son of a gun, Benjamin Truck. So, oh, the story of Jen. <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, as as in in uh, Henry's law, we talk about that a gas dissolves in a liquid based upon the agitation and the temperature. As the temperature gets colder, it gets denser, and it will it will uh, dissolve more quickly. So, in hypothermia, one of the things to be aware of is nitrogen will dissolve uh, into your system much more quickly. So, uh, Caleb, if we take that into, into account, that we're getting more nitrogen, how would that affect diving in the cold? You've got to um, adjust your times, think about, well, also think about how you can protect yourself. Um, actually, that would be a question for me. Does exposure systems 
uh, can that positively impact how you can dive in the cold or is the, you know, does the um, environment dictate that regardless of your body temperature? That's a great question and it's a great, I, I, I love that you took us there. So absolutely, one of the things that we do when we dive is we certainly load up on exposure protection to make sure we stay warm. The reason we stay warm is because gas can dissolve more quickly when we're cold. So, for example, when we're ice diving, we always wear a dry suit because we want to protect ourselves from the ravages of hypothermia, which are certainly deadly to itself. But it also can create a situation, um, an environment where we're more susceptible to the bends. Now, if I know that I'm more susceptible to the bends to, to a DCS um, because of cold, not just not just being being cold, but because cold, uh, because of cold, how would that affect my safety stops and my ascent rate? Slow down, increase your safety stops. Absolutely, I need to give that gas time to uh, evacuate for to uh, diffuse. That's our magic term for the day. Gases perfuse into the tissue and diffuse out of the tissue. So I need to give myself more time. Now, we're already at altitude, so we know we need to slow down. So at our altitude, we should really be doing an ascent at about 22 feet per minute if you did the math on it. So we just say 20 feet per minute for easy numbers to remember. And we know that at altitude that we should be doing a little bit longer safety stop and being more concerned with that. The diving nitrox is to our advantage because of that. But in being cold, we need to be extra sensitive to that as well. So if we're diving the lake and it's 33 degrees, we know that as whether we're wearing a dry suit or not, we're still there's still going to be a measure of cold. We need to protect ourselves because we know that that cold gas is going to be perfusing into our tissues much more easily um, as we go through this process. So we need to be aware of that and, and certainly cognizant of that through the process. And it's one of the reasons we, we wear the correct, correct exposure gear. So that's really one of the things that I, I mean, I think we here in Idaho have a, deeper understanding of hypothermia when you when you get hypothermia and some of the effects i mean a loss of cognitive ability duh right nobody thinks really well when they're cold we think you son of a bitch that got me out here in the cold right um i i, I can remember a few times sitting in foxholes in the middle of the desert when it was it it went from 130 degrees during the day to you know 40 degrees at night and i was shivering my butt off because we're in the freaking desert thinking <laughs> Goddamn Uncle Sam, you son of a put me in a freaking you know, whatever you you know, whatever you say. You, damn Marine Corps, right? Whatever it is, right? We we say our we say our little curse words to to whomever we choose to blame for that situation other than ourselves. Um, but we also realize that we lose dexterity. Um, that there's other things that happen as well. We can um one of the things you'll find about diving in Idaho is um, especially in the winter, that most dives are limited not by the non-decompression limits, but by our ability to tolerate cold. Hmm. So we, as your fingers start to get cold, Josh, did your fingers get cold at all this weekend? No, they were warm, toasty. Oh, that's fantastic. Even at, even at the 105, 108 foot depth, you were trying yeah, to- Yeah, you know, 40, 44 degrees, you know, makes your fingers warm up. Absolutely. It was so, as Josh <laughs> will tell you, it, it, was, it was nice and warm at the surface. What was it, 70 degrees this weekend? Yeah, like 60. Yeah, 67 degrees. It was beautiful outside. It, I, I was sweating in my dry suit. Oh, surface, yeah. At the yeah. surface? Oh, it was toasty. But even surface water temp was still like 60. Yeah, surface water temp was 60, but at depth, we were di we were diving 44 degrees. Yeah, no, it was cold. It was cold on my hands. Yeah, so this is not Florida. Um, we're diving cold water, whether you like it or not. I don't... <clears throat> and the deeper you go, the, the colder it will get. The nice thing is, Josh, just wait, wait till we start diving in December. You'll you'll immediately want to get down to that depth because the, the 44 will be the nice warm water. Uh, you'll have a reverse thermal climb. So you'll think you'll be thanking, Hey, Ben, can we do a deep dive today? Should we do some deco today? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but just remember that, that time at deco is not at the hundred, at the warmer water, 44 degrees. That time at deco will be at the 20, 20 foot mark where that will be 33 degrees or 35 degrees, whatever it is. Right. So you're going to be decoying the cold stuff. And so just be aware that if you get cold while you're depth, you still have to come up and 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 uh, uh, deal with the other stuff. So I very rarely deco in December in uh, Ryrie. It's it's just not just not a really great idea, because by the time you figure out that it's time, then you get to go up to that safety stop or that in that deco stop and you get to be very miserable. 
but uh, we go through that process. And so we understand that in a deeper level, what I really want you guys to get that, because I mean, I think I, I would be surprised if anybody in this group has not been snowmobiling or been out to the ski resort and been freaking colder than a welder's behind, right? Colder than my ex-wife's heart, right? Um, whatever that is, right? So we, we all have that understanding, but I want you to understand more thoroughly that in Henry's law, that as that gas gets colder, it absorbs more profusely, right? It, uh, it, it perfuses much more quickly. So we need to be certainly aware of that. Now, one of the things we don't talk about um, is can hypothermia happen in the summertime? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Donnie tells a great story. Uh, they had a, uh, one of the Marines um, had been outside all day at 130 degrees and sweating his butt off and came into the uh, 70 degrees uh, um, Quonset. Uh, where the Air Force was at, of course, um, and uh, absolutely ended up with hypothermia, uh, intense shivers, uh, loss of dexterity, uh, loss of motor skills, uh, slurred speech, went straight into hypothermia. So it absolutely can happen. It's when your core body temperature is chilled um, below its normal temperature, right? So just be aware. Um, so other things to be aware of. Um, I think we've all got, a, uh, I think Chase did a fantastic job on heat stroke and heat exhaustion. I think we've all got a pretty good understanding of that as well. Um, I have a quick little video on hypothermia just, just for fun for you guys. So I'll go ahead and uh, uh, share that real quick with you. Share screen. It's kind of a fun one, another little. Hypothermia. It's something you see all too often in movies starring Leonardo DiCaprio. But what is it exactly? And how does it really happen? Our body is always trying to maintain a balmy temperature of around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. Hypothermia occurs when our body loses heat faster than we can produce it. And hypothermia doesn't only strike sinking ship victims and 19th century fur trappers wandering in the wilderness. Studies estimate that about 1,500 Americans die of accidental hypothermia each year. In fact, exposure to the cold is responsible for twice as many deaths as heat exposure annually. Young children and the elderly are especially vulnerable. So why is hypothermia so dangerous? Most heat loss occurs when unprotected surfaces radiate heat away from the body. In addition, wearing wet clothes makes heat loss even worse. And wind chill can quickly escalate the situation because it strips away the thin layer of heat on the skin's surface. As your temperature drops, your body and brain fire back. Your thyroid and adrenal glands release a flood of hormones that boost your metabolism, heart rate, and blood pressure. In the brain, the hypothalamus tells your blood vessels to constrict this moves the blood further from the skin surface where heat can escape. Your hypothalamus also signals your muscles to shiver, which kicks your metabolism into overdrive two to five times the normal rate. At this point, you're on the brink. If you don't get to safety soon, you'll hit severe hypothermia and be in serious trouble. Eventually, even your brain will grow colder. When this happens, it stops functioning properly, which can make you feel dizzy, disoriented, and even want to strip naked. Before too long, you'll run the risk of permanent brain damage. But just how long do you have? It's hard to know because each situation and person is completely different. However, radiologist Anna Bagenholm currently holds the record for surviving the coldest body temperature. After a skiing accident, she endured 80 minutes in freezing cold water. Her body temperature had plummeted to 56.7 degrees Fahrenheit or 13.7 degrees Celsius. Hopefully that never happens to you, but here are some tips for treating hypothermia with several safety measures. Immediate first aid. Victims can also be treated with warm IV fluids and salt water solutions. And you can help avoid hypothermia with some safety measures like wearing appropriate clothing, avoiding overexertion in cold conditions, and letting people know what time you expect to arrive. Run smart, travel smart, and dress smart, even if it makes you look like a giant marshmallow. <laughs> a 
Let's see more. Next. All right. So kind of an interesting little video. I, I thought it as well. What did you guys think of that? I mean, for this group, for this group is a little on the simple side, but it definitely gave you a, um, a kind of a a, 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 a basic idea um, and uh, of what we're uh, what we're talking about as well. So that was kind of the the fun thing. Now, one of the things that we talk a, li a lot about in open water class, we talk a lot about lung overexpansion injuries. Um, now, the thing about it is, is at this point in the game with all of you. <laughs> um, you should have a pretty good understanding of how these happen. Now, we, we all have, have got the basic idea that um, a lung overexpansion injury can happen as little as four feet of water. And this is a yes and a no uh, truth, right? Um, generally, the, the pressure of the water changes by one half PSI for every uh, foot. Um, you can pop a lung in two, with two PSI of change, um, right? Now, why is this partially true and not true, Brian? Why do you think? Why do you think uh, this would be true and not true? So, I mean, I think partially true is just, you know, if you're going simply by the math, you know, math normally doesn't lie. Um, but it might also be partially, I mean, if I had to guess, it would be that if our bodies are seeking that homeostasis and trying to equalize that as we do something there, that our body will try and compensate for that fact. Okay, so let's talk about this. How much pressure change is there between 33 feet and we're, and we're always going to talk feet seawater in this class. We know three, three fresh water is 34, but we're just going to talk feet seawater because it as our commonality. So what's the pressure change between 33 feet and zero feet? So it's, uh, yeah, 14.7, about 0.7 pounds. So it's it's a it's a 50% change, is it not? So it depends oh, on you're which way you're going. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. The pressure, yeah. If you go from 33 to zero, it's a double. Fair enough. It doubles. Now, what's the pressure change between 66 feet and 33 feet? Uh, so that's what is that? It's a just change. Am I thinking about that? Is that backwards, or is that a one and a half, one and a half time change? 33 percent so between 60 feet and 33 66 feet and 33 feet would be a 33 percent between 99 feet and 66 feet would be a 25 percent uh change and so on right it's it's a having all the way through right does that make sense mm -hmm. so yes if I, i'm stressing out and i'm worrying about a 33 foot per minute ascent rate where would that be the most important in the last well, from 33 feet, or yeah, from 33 feet to the surface. Absolutely. Now, would it be nearly as important between 130 feet and 99 feet? Not near. I mean, still important, but not nearly as critical or potentially damaging. Absolutely. And and so we set our limits, and when we start talking about 33 feet per minute, we talk we talk about at the least common denominator. Everything we build in, in diving, and I want you guys to kind of get start getting the, the light bulb on, is everything we talk about through this process, through what we've been talking about, is based on the least common denominator. The dive tables are built around a 60-year-old man, not a 19-year-old not a uh, Marine. Fair enough? Yep. So would we say that the 19-year-old Marine fresh out of boot camp or OCS is – uh, less likely to have a cardiac event during a dive than a 60 year old man that works at, at an insurance office. For love of God, I'd hope so. Right. <laughs> right so yeah. we oversimplify. I want you guys to kind of get the idea that a lot of this is very much oversimplified. So as we start Ooh. talking about um, the effects of pressure on ascent, we need to be aware of that. Now, the number one rule of, of diving is always breathe just for this, um, this idea that. Uh, yeah. always breathe, never hold your breath, right? And as long as you do that, you're never going to have a, low, a lung overexpansion injury through this process. Yeah. But being aware of that, um, that if there's something that happening, and for example, I'm at 150 feet and I need, I've got an emergency, I need to head to the surface. I know that from 150 feet to 60 feet, I can cruise at 60 feet per minute and still not to have the same effects, but I need to slow down. And once I hit 60 feet, 60 feet that I need to slow down to 33 feet per minute because yeah. the, 
what's the pressure gradient differentiation between 150 feet and 60 feet versus 60 feet to uh, to zero feet? Is it less or more? Less. Well, it's much less. Yeah, the 150 feet to 60 feet is going to be, it's literally going to be two thirds. If you do the math, it's about two thirds the pressure change as it is from 60 feet to zero, right? Mm -hmm. And if we did from 150 feet to 33 feet and 33 feet to zero, it's pretty darn close to equal. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to kind of get that through your guys' idea, your heads as we talk about the effects of pressure on the lungs. Now, please always dive 33 feet per minute. It's just an easier way to uh, to be safe and make sure and we we do that in all our dive planning um, and make sure that you're taken care of. But be aware that overexpansion injuries happen based upon holding your breath and based upon overexpansion ideas. So be aware. Now, there are predisposing factors that actually can uh, kick in and, and, and cause problems, um, but they are definitely of cons uh, not as much concern as most people realize. The more concerning ones are things like AGEs, and they can actually happen more readily than, than a pneumothorax or a, a subcutaneous emphysema or so on. So I've got a really cool one on ar arterial gas embolism. This this guy is actually a barotrauma uh, doctor. And uh, let's, can you guys see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome. Screens are working better lately. Uh, why are you on a video? Oh, hey, hey, Ben. Yes, sir. Um, for videos, when you share your screen, there might be an option to share audio, which we would be able to hear it better if you can if you do that. So don't worry wondering. about it. But... Uh, apparently, this this video is not going to play anyway. So, oh bummer. That's too bad. I liked that video, um, but I do have a replacement video. Can you guys see my screen now? See your slideshow. Yeah, we still oh, okay. have an AGE video. Gotcha. Let me reshare that. There we go. Do you see Dr. Lance? Yes. Yep. All right. Yep. Right now, let's talk about uh, the big scary arterial gas embolism or air gas embolism, or cerebral arterial gas embolism. So, embolism just means something floating in your blood. And we talked about an arterial gas and what we're talking about gas in the artery. So you got a bubble that's flowing in an artery and it's made of air. It's made of the air that you're breathing. This is not a pure nitrogen problem like decompression sickness. This is a mechanical problem where a bubble goes into the wrong circulation. Most of the time it will go to the head, to the brain, and that's a cerebral uh, air gas embolism or arterial gas embolism, as some people call it. And so we call it a cage, C-A-G-E. Uh, and if that happens, it causes a stroke phenomenon. How does it happen? Well, we think that the majority of the time it comes with a pulmonary overinflation syndrome. In other words, as you're coming up in the water column, you're finished, you're dying, you're ascending, you know you're supposed to exhale and let a free flow of air come out so you're not trapping, expanding air in your lungs. But sometimes things happen. You know, in the last 20 feet of your dive is the biggest volume of air expansion. And you might be in rough seas and you're bobbing six, seven feet uh, in between breaths. Maybe you're just not thinking. Maybe you've run out of air underwater and you're bolting to the surface and you panicked and you're cramping down. Now the uh, expanding air in your lungs may shear the inner lining of your lung and let air track along that circulation it gets here towards the heart and they cross over get into the circulation going out of the heart and boom the circulation going to the brain all of a sudden you've got a small bubble maybe the size of the head of this pen maybe that big but it's it's a small bubble but if it's in an artery that supplies blood to your brain that's a real problem and you can get a massive stroke phenomenon that paralyzes part of your body that causes you to be unconscious or almost immediately dead. These things do happen. Or more insidiously, you might get a very small bubble that just starts to starve a small part of the brain for oxygen. You might have very subtle symptoms, uh, a, lo a loss of a visual field, uh, things you can't see on one side, or perhaps a loss of balance. You become dizzy. Maybe you have loss of motor control of, of a, an arm or a, a muscle group. Maybe you uh, 
I've lost the sensation of changing the way you think or speak or any of these subtle findings. Now, with any arterial gas embolism, the good news is, even though it acts like a stroke, treating a normal stroke, a blood clot stroke, is, is difficult. You've got to try to get some clot busting medications or some blood thinning medications on board some of the time. This may be, be very dangerous. The good thing is, if we get a gas embolism in the brain into the chamber uh, within a few hours, we're usually going to be able to restore normal brain, normal tissue. Remember, time to treatment is tissue in this regard. We probably have at the outside about a five-hour window, but hopefully we want to get the patient a lot sooner than that. We need to get that air gas embolism treated as soon as possible, restore blood flow, crush that bubble down, let blood start moving through that artery, bringing oxygen to that part of the brain that may be dying, but is still salvageable, and get that back together. So. If someone has a big arterial gas embolism and they're paralyzed or nearly unconscious or fully unconscious, you're going to recognize this. It's, that's a no-brainer. We're going to have to get the emergency system activated. But if it's a smaller gas embolism, a very small bubble and causes a, a very insidious change, that's where we've got to be heads up for each other. We've got to be heads up to hybrids. We've got to look out for each other. Dr. Mandeman, 2006. Help for each other. We've got to observe other divers in our group, especially if we're new to each other. Uh, even if people understand what we're like, what our normal neurological function is, I don't ask for support divers to uh, expert neurological examiners. Now, in Navy diving, there are very strict standards, and all Navy divers learn a fundamental neurological exam before you go underwater. Any Navy diving here, you buy the book, there's an entire sweep of the crew, the dive soup is looking at each person. Afterwards, uh, the dive supervisor is going to look at each person again, each diver, check to see that they're clear, watch them for 15 minutes. We don't do this in civilian diving, even organizational diving. But what I do ask us all to do is pay attention to that culture of safety, and we'll talk about that in another video. But the, the culture of safety means we're not afraid to ask other divers to know who we are and to pay attention to us, and in turn, we're good buddies to other divers, and we're going to say to them, hey, I, I know what you look like, what you normally are, and if you're not acting right, I'm going to get help for you. Because... Say with arterial gas embolism, a cerebral arterial gas embolism. First of all, if you're having a stroke type activity to the brain, you guys still there? I'm yeah. still here. Yeah, video's uh, paused. You there, Ben, or we'd lose you? While we're waiting for Ben. Chase, I, I don't think I have your number. I got everyone else's number. I got a few questions for you. Oh. All right. I'll go ahead and. No need to share it publicly, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, start with the internet, Chase. Ben says he'll be right back. He says he'll be right back. Fucking internet. Oh, God, he's recording this. Uh, it's okay. You can cuss as long as it's not in the first. Recording his language, I guess. <laughs> no cussing on the on the recorded video. Anyway, that um, hopefully oh, look like you guys got both your bows in that. 
Um, do you guys want to continue on that one? I feel pretty good with it. Okay. All right. <laughs> I think a lot a lot of this doesn't need to be gone over because Chase did a fantastic job of it. I've got uh, uh, one more video uh, for you guys, and uh, I think that you might like. This one covers DCS a little bit more. Um, just a quick five-minute one. So once you've established the diagnosis of deep compression illness, the standard treatment we're going to give them is uh, what's called a US Navy table six. The first thing we need to do before we put the diagnosis chamber is to obtain the consent to explain that the purpose of the treatment is to cure or at least ameliorate their deep compression illness and then to inform them about the risk of complications that may occur. The most serious complication, which is relatively rare, is oxygen toxicity and neurological toxicity can occur when you're exposed to oxygen at pressures above sea level and this usually manifests itself as a grand mal epileptic seizure it's not turning the diver into an epileptic because it can't occur at pressures around sea level only at high pressures but there will be a nurse in the chamber with them to look after them if they do have this problem and the diver obviously needs to be aware of it. It's about a 1% risk of it occurring for this particular treatment. The other oxygen toxicity that they may sustain is pulmonary oxygen toxicity, and this is more related to the total exposure of oxygen they occur. It can happen with this single treatment, but it's more common if they have more prolonged treatment or if they have repeated treatments. Uh, the manifestation of that is usually some retrosternal pain, Perhaps a little bit of um, burning behind the behind the sternum, a dry cough, possibly some breathlessness, and if you look to undertake the pulmonary function test, you might find that FRC is reduced. This is largely reversible by making sure that the diver breathes air in between their treatments if they're having multiple treatments in the chamber, and it will settle down of its own accord and can be treated symptomatically if necessary. More common complications which are less serious are barotrauma, of which problems with the ears are the most common. Now, divers are used to clearing their ears when they dive, so they usually don't have an issue with this. But you need to discuss it with them and make sure that they do clear their ears with valsalva maneuvers or, or such like as they go down and report any problems as they descend. You can rarely also get problems with uh, barotrauma to the sinuses or sometimes to uh, fillings in the teeth if there's gas trapped in there. There may be an issue with claustrophobia once they're shut in the chamber. Not usually with experienced divers, but if it's somebody who's just been diving for the first time and did find they were claustrophobic at depth and has sustained decompression illness, then it might be an issue as well. Once you've been through all the complications and uh, got their consent, uh, then you can proceed to the treatment. So the treatment that the diver is actually going to receive, they're going to be repressurized in the hyperbaric chamber. So we'll secure them in the chamber with a nurse to look after them, and it will be taken down to a depth equivalent to 18 meters of seawater. The uh, diver will be at 2.8 atmospheres, absolute. Once they're at depth, they're going to receive cycles of oxygen, 100% oxygen by a foot. The idea of this is that the pressure itself that they're exposed to will compress the bubbles that are causing their decompression illness, and thereby usually uh, produces almost instant relief of symptoms once you get to depth. By also giving them oxygen at that depth, what we're going to do is improve the oxygenation of the tissues that may have been impaired by the presence of the bubbles in the circulation and the tissues themselves. And also, we're going to reduce the amount of nitrogen in the patient's body in their circulation, which will encourage the nitrogen that's in the bubbles to diffuse out, travel to the lungs and be breathed out by the patient to actually relieve their decompression sickness. They'll receive three cycles of oxygen at this 18 meter depth with a short air break between each one. The purpose of the air breaks is to reduce the risk of them getting an oxygen toxicity seizure. Because of the risk of regurgitation and aspiration if the diver does have an episode of neurological oxygen toxicity, it's important that they don't eat before they go in the chamber. 
they can have clear fluids orally and these should be encouraged because every single diver with decompression illness is significantly dehydrated. They've been exercising at depth, they won't have drunk during their dive and they may well not have received any fluids after their dive as well. In fact, if there are clinical signs of dehydration, we'll usually set up an intravenous drip as well. Once we're at the depth, we will assess the patient's symptoms and signs uh, with the assistance of the nurse in the chamber and see if they're improving. If they're not improving, then there's two possibilities. Either you've got the diagnosis wrong, which is quite possible because decompression of an illness can impersonate all sorts of other conditions. So you need to review that. If you're confident of your diagnosis and they're not improving, then you have an option to what's called extend the table by giving two more cycles of oxygen at that depth. A standard US Navy table six will take about five hours, but it will go to a little over seven hours if you extend it fully at both 18 and nine meters. After their three cycles of oxygen or their possible two extensions at that depth, you're then going to reduce the pressure to nine meters of seawater, so 1.9 atmospheres, where they're going to receive further oxygen cycles. The oxygen cycles at this uh, pressure are longer, uh, and as are the air breaks. And we usually do two cycles of oxygen at this step, and the air breaks for about 15 minutes, which gives the diver a chance to get some fluids and to have something to eat if they want. Once you've completed the oxygen cycles at nine meters of seawater, that will be either two or four cycles of oxygen. You cannot extend the table any further than that, but you need to slowly surface. The reason for that is that the nurse in the chamber has also been exposed to the same pressure and they need to decompress. And if you stay any longer at that depth, you will be in a saturation setting. Once you're at the surface, you'll bring the patient out of the chamber and formally reassess their signs and symptoms to see whether they've completely got better or whether they've got any residual uh, issues. They'll go to the ward uh, to be observed overnight at least because they can get a relapse or a recurrence of their decompression symptoms or even develop new symptoms. And if that happens, you will want to retreat them either with another table six or with other modified uh, recompression tables. If they're still not improving, then what we would normally do in the case of a severe decompression illness is go into what's called saturation. A saturation dive, we will go to 30 meters of seawater, which is four atmospheres. We will replace the uh, nitrogen in the chamber with helium. So they'll be breathing a mixture of helium and oxygen and give them cycles of 50% oxygen in helium at that depth to try and relieve their symptoms further. Saturation means that the diver's tissues become completely saturated with helium at that depth. And the idea there is we can give a much more prolonged treatment and the diver will be in there for several days uh, with two nurses. And once we've either reached a plateau or cured their symptoms, then we will very slowly ascend back to normal atmospheric pressure, which actually takes, well, usually around about 48 hours or even longer. So it's quite a major undertaking to go into saturation, but can help to relieve the symptoms in the more severe cases. I'm not sure what that was. Somebody's beeping. But I thought that was a pretty interesting uh, to talk to listen to. And, and as it goes through the process, it's, it's things we don't think about. I mean, we talk about treating for shock. We talk about getting them hydrated. But um, he reinforced the idea through that process that we're not only doing that, but the diver's been down for an hour. So they haven't been drinking for an hour. So they're most likely dehydrated. They've been exercising for an hour. So they've been, uh, so they're going to be dehydrated to that process. So it's really interesting to hear him talk about that and reinforce that from a different point of view as well as it, as they go through this and the neurological signs and symptoms. Did you guys find that as, as interesting as I did? Yes. Yeah. yeah I'd, I'd love yes. to get a copy yeah. of the links of your videos sometime uh, if that's appropriate. That's absolutely appropriate. I have no problem sitting out the deck um, at all. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I only thing I ever want from you guys is to be able to, to learn and come back to them as well. So, um, and, and uh, that's why it's one of the reasons we record these as well. 
Um, as we so go through this, go maybe, maybe you don't know the answer to this, Ben, but why, I guess, in a normal dive or even in a decompression dive, why would normal a normal decompression be our table six or whatever? Why would that not care? Why would you have to go into full saturation to get rid of the DCS? Uh, what they're doing is they're they're uh, they're overpowering the hemoglobin barrier, um, and so when you start talking about oxygen toxicity, <coughs> and you start getting to the, the CNS portion of that, uh, or the pul- I'm sorry, not CNS, the pulmonary oxygen toxicity. What ends up happening is as you start pushing too much oxygen to this high pressure of 1.6, 2.0, 3.0. 2.8, right? At, at this at these point, what it does is it overwhelms, at one point or another, it starts to overwhelm the hemoglobin barrier and forcing, and lit- and then it gets to the point where it's actually bathing and forcing the nitrogen out uh, more accurately. And that's what's happening and, and forcing it more quickly. So we're overpowering it by and pushing the, pushing it out by over overpowering it. Um, oxygen actually, once it gets to a point of excess excessive amount of uh, pure oxygen, the pulmonary uh, uh, method, it can actually clog up and block the hemoglobin barrier to the point that the lungs are no longer able to uptake oxygen. And you actually um, basically not drown, but uh, um, have, um, asphyxiate um, hmm. from an excessive amount of oxygen. It's really it, partial pressure oxygen. It's, it's really interesting. The more you get into the pulmonary uh, digest of it, the more interesting it becomes. And the more you get into it, I actually... I, I caught um, on uh, uh, toxicity. I caught a Harvard professor that's from India. He's got a couple lectures. He has one on AGE that I liked as well. But he talks about that. And the only problem was, is he, in about the first five minutes, he gets so deep into it that you have to stop it and keep back rewinding it because he, he's he's so far uh, ahead on this. And and his Indian accent doesn't make it e- easier as well. Maybe Chase will understand him and, and tell him namaste as well. But... Um, <laughs> It was definitely an extremely interesting. So the more you get into this, the more you, you start getting the idea of what's going on. And and it's interesting as you start kind of getting the idea of how long we've been studying this. Um, it, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, J. Lorraine Smith um, first started talking and, and studying uh, the toxicity and how oxygen worked with the body through the system in the lungs and its toxic effects in 1899. So we've been studying this for a few moments, and it's interesting. Hmm. Uh, that's kind of where we're heading. Is uh, he first described it in his in his studies in 1899? He noted that the severity of these effects af- increased with the increased partial pressure, and that the effects were largely reversible um, through this process. And so he started noticing that toxic effects in oxygen and partial pressures between 0.45 and 1.6 are primarily in the lungs, and the toxic hmm. effects um, of 1.6 um, and above or primarily in the brain. Um, so we start talking the difference between pulmonary is when we do long periods of oxygen at lower pressures. Pulmonary is what it's, um, when we do long bouts, longer bouts at 1.6 or above. Um, so it's, it's interesting to go through that. And it's interesting that he talked about the idea that only 1% of uh, DCS issues actually end up at a CNS issue with a grand mal seizure. So it's, it's really interesting as you go through that. Now, as, as we kind of go through that, let's let's talk about the toxic sy- signs and symptoms in the pulmonary uh, region first. And so as we start looking at the, the issues with high partial pressures of oxygen in the, in the lower settings, <coughs> in that 0.45, which is a very low number, by the way, to 1.6, um, we start noticing the early signs are, um, and symptoms of that are mild irritation in the trachea of the throat, um, which gets worse as you uh, with deeper breathing. A mild cough develops. Maybe I've got, maybe I don't have a cold, maybe I have pulmonary oxygen toxicity. Uh, all these dives, maybe that's the issue. I don't know. I don't think that's it. I would highly doubt. Um, now, just by the way, um, any of these signs and symptoms, pulmonary oxygen toxicity, central nervous system toxicity, DCS, um, uh, the bends uh, can show up anywhere from 15 minutes after a dive up to three days. So it can take up to three days for some of these signs and symptoms to start kind of developing. So I kind of want to throw that in there and, you know, kind of left field throw there. Sorry about that. But let's kind of jump back into it. So the signs and symptoms of that mild cough, that irrit- irritation in the throat, 
um, and followed by more severe irritation and cough until breathing becomes painful and the cough becomes uncontrollable. <coughs> There's my pulmonary, right? Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, now, if this if the exposure to oxygen is continued, the person is going to notice, start noticing a tightness in the chest because they're not able to breathe, inspire, perfuse oxygen the same way. They're going to have difficulty breathing and shortness of breath. Now, if this oxygen uh, exposure is continued long enough, the person dies from basically a lack of oxygen. They go hypoxic because the uh, overwhelming pressure um, on the um, alveoli to the hemoglobin barrier has been overwhelmed and overrun. So we do it for too long. We can overrun it for a while, but at some point, it gets hard, right? You know, it can only accept yeah. so much. Now, the progressive damage of the lungs eventually makes it impossible oxygen to get past into the lungs and pass through pass through the lungs. So it is interesting to notice that, uh, know that the time onset of symptoms is highly variable. And we've talked about this at ad nauseum um, to the point of it's, we really get that idea that Chase, how you process oxygen and nitrogen in your system is very different than how I do. Caleb, you're different. Byron, Joshua, you're both different from each other and from me as well. Yes. Well, I, just, I was going to say that one of the simple ways to kind of think about it is that oxygen is naturally corrosive and it's corrosive to your cells too, but your cells are designed so that they can repair the damage at a sustained rate uh, that the oxygen causes corrosion. However, at a higher partial pressure, the rate of corrosion to the cells and the damage to the cells exceeds the cell's ability to repair it. And so those higher oxygen concentrations and partial pressures inside the lungs will actually begin to harden the alveoli and make them more rigid, which is a part of the contributing cause to making it hard to breathe mm -hmm. and hard to pull the air in. And it's just basically, that's why in, in table six, they do uh, the 20 minutes on and five minutes off. Is that five minutes off of that high partial pressure gives your cells an opportunity to repair themselves from that damage before you get put back onto that 2.8 partial pressure. That's exactly right. Um, Interesting. Absolutely right. As you go through this process, so, it, but kind of continue that process is we're all different. Now, one of the things to be aware of on this differences as well is not just we're different from each other, but tomorrow I'll be different than today, and yesterday mm -hmm. I was different than today. And, and whether it's yet good or better is a whole different thing. Um, mm -hmm. Some days it's going to be good. Some days it's going to be better. For example, good example. Um, I will have a lower sac rate on days that I'm well hydrated, hmm. well rested, relaxed, and Nikki hasn't chewed me out about the laundry. Um, <laughs> Nikki never chews me out about the laundry. That's, that's a joke, of course. But if I go on the same boat the, on the next day and I drink, everything's the same, and I drink a bunch of Gatorade, I'm going to have a lower sac rate. Mm -hmm. Something as simple. I mean, two days, exactly the same. Nikki and I are in a good space together. Everything's good. Um, mm. She baked me a cake the night before uh, or a lemon meringue pie, which is my favorite. Um, and, uh, you know, showed up um, with this and and uh, my favorite prime rib, right? Life is good. But um, the next day I drank some Gatorade. So just so you guys know, Gatorade uh, um, uh, thickens up the, the cell uh, the cell walls and allow doesn't allow us um, – oxygen to penetrate and travel as easily. So you're not, your cells aren't able to gain the benefit of the oxygen because it's not traveling through the system as easily because of the, the plumped up cells from the, from the Gatorade, right? So something as stupid as that will reduce your oxygen uptake. Something as stupid mm -hmm. as I, I sat at the back of the boat court next to the diesel fumes and you sat at the front of the boat away from the diesel fumes. So every day is different <laughs> how, how all this happens, right? Um, so as we kind of look at that, most individuals, uh, if we were to take a, a, a general average, can tolerate about 12 to 16 hours of oxygen at 100%. Hmm. Eight to 14 hours. And now this is pulmonary. Let's be very clear. Mm -hmm. Eight to 14 hours at 1.5 partial pressure and three to six hours at 200% before developing mild symptoms. So as we talked about it, we, and as we learned, um, from the pressure chamber, from from Chase's talk, very clearly that they're doing that at 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, right, for five to six hours. Mm -hmm. we realize um, in that that we're extending that three to six hours at two uh, at partial pressure before mild symptoms occur. But that's one of the reasons that a decompression chamber only goes up to five to six hours, right, is mm -hmm. because they're concerned about the signs and symptoms of pulmonary oxygen uh, happening, and our bodies mm -hmm. can only stand so much. 
Now, there's several ways to track pulmonary oxygen toxicity as well, but the most sensitive, most accurate are the development of symptoms. Hmm. So if they're coughing, irritation, tightness in the chest, things like that. Now, a second technique to monitor is to monitor their vital capacity. And vital capacity is the amount of air that can be moved in one breath. Now, decreases with increased uh, pulmonary toxicity will happen. Now, a reduction of approximately 2% in vital capacity correlates with mild symptoms. While a reduction of 10, around 10% correlates with symptoms so severe that most individuals will not voluntarily continue to breathe. Hmm. So now these will generally occur. But however, this because just like Chase said, we, that we self-heal, it may take two to four to five weeks to heal. So be aware. Now, as we start moving into the more concerning factor we're starting to worry about with auction, have I still got you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Now, the more concerning one that we that we worry a little bit more about um, is obviously CNS, CNS toxicity. Um, and again, this is a highly variable idea, but it uh, becomes concerning after 1.1 for CNS toxicity, right? Hmm. Anything after 1.1, we we have the a higher chance of developing symptoms. Um, that's why our working partial pressure um, for diving is 1.4 or less. For additional safety, 1.1. Now, um, substantial risk starts to occur at the closer to get to 1.6. So as we start getting that 1.6, uh, uh, we start getting to a, a much more sustainable rate of CNS toxicity. Now, this is one of the reasons that Chase brought this up perfectly is that's one of the reasons in the auction chamber that they do 20 minute cycles. They give the, the cells a chance. Now, unfortunately with diving, we don't have that choice. We can't, we, as we get down to 150 feet on 30%, we're at, at that one point, we're at 1.7. We don't have that option. All we could do is ascend the water column and get to a lower pressure. So we definitely need to make sure we're tracking our CNS toxicity through this process. But if we do get into CNS toxicity, there's some basic ideas to be aware of. And, and I talk about this a lot. And how we feel going in the water is how we should feel coming out of the water, right? Maybe we're a little bit more tired, but not usually. <coughs> so as we look at this, oxygen toxicity's number one sign and symptom that we all look for is, he talked about that in the video, was convulsions, grand mal seizures, usually without warning us. And again, it's not that they're getting, they're becoming epileptic, but uh, they're having those convulsions because of the amount of toxicity that's going through the brain. Now, mm. earlier signs and symptoms to kind of take a look at are going to be pretty simple. Vision. Are you getting tunnel vision or any other change in your vision? Ears ringing. Nausea. Uh, mild, severe, continuous, or intermittent, in, any of that. Uh, twitching. Usually the facial muscles uh, is most frequently the, the uh, idea. But uh, if you're having odd twitches as well. Irritability, changes in behavior, or dizziness, vertigo. Uh, any of those are definitely uh, concerns. We remember those by the acronym CONVENTED. Uh, C-O-N for convulsions, V for vision, ear, E for ears, N for nausea, twitching, irritability, and dizziness, right? Convented. Uh, so as we go through that process, we start looking at that. But as we start thinking about this, what happens? I get back on the dive boat and I'm all of a sudden nauseous. Have I got a CNS toxicity? Probably not. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It's definitely something to look at. What's going on? Why is he going to the back of the boat um, shooting for distance and accuracy? <laughs> right and you'll hear every every dive master will say that if if you get sick go to the back corner of the boat away from the wind and and shoot for distance and accuracy you know they they say it every dive right uh, it's it's a common thing but you know I've, I've had that happen i um i was on a dive with my daughter um this is a, a bunch of years ago but um we'd got uh dive number two and i didn't realize that i had lost a weight pocket and i, I just realized it was hard for me to get to depth um, that's all, that's all I knew is it was just, I was having a hard time. And once I got to depth, like I was having a hard time staying down. So I got this big rock and I found a rock and I was swimming around with this rock for 30 minutes. And my, my daughter was like, what the hell's up with the rock? And I'm like, just, you just do you, I'm going to do me. You know, I'm dying with my rock. Leave me alone. It's my pet rock. Some guy made a million dollars with these things in the seventies. So leave me alone, whatever, you know? So finally, um, not thinking about it. I was like, I'm done with this dive. I'm, I'm carrying the damn rock. I'm not having fun. I'm not seeing the fish. I'm not enjoying myself. I'm going to the surface. 
unfortunately, um, as I uh, uh, went to the surface on this, um, I decided that it was a good idea to drop my rock. So I got to my 15 feet for my safety stop and I couldn't stay down. So I was head down, feet in the air, and I was kicking my butt off. I, I looked like freaking Michael Phelps or Greg Luganis or who, somebody, one of the swimmers, right? Um, Mark Spitz, right? For my generation. But I was swimming like, like a madman for three straight minutes. My daughter was at the safety stop floating next to me. She's like, what the hell are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just trying to stay down, man. And I popped the surface. Um, when I stopped kicking, I, mean, I, I popped the surface like a freaking Triton missile. Um, and uh, one of the things we were supposed to do is at our safety stop launch our SMB because we were in a drift dive. Um, I got to the surface. I popped it. I immediately felt myself getting sick. I, I did my chest strap. I did it under my Velcro. Um, and uh, Brittany popped the surface. She said, why haven't you launched the SMB? And I'm like, yeah, I, I had all the damn fish. And I got back to the boat. The boat was rocking because there was a good current. I got back to the back of the boat and I, I went ahead and I, I launched for distance and uh, um, accuracy as well. It happens, right? But I didn't have any other, other signs and symptoms, right? So be aware as, as you start seeing one thing, just because you see a rash doesn't mean, um, you know, the bends, you know, it, it certainly, you know, if you hear hooves, think horses, but, you know, let's look at the bigger picture of this process. If, if uh, I've got a, a rash, is there a chance that I got into some fire coral? You know, let's let's think about the the uh, dynamic of what this is. Just because I'm nauseous doesn't mean I have have that. But let's you know, is there are there other things going on? Should we certainly treat for dehydration? Absolutely. Should we certainly monitor the situation to make sure this diver is okay? Absolutely. So just be aware. You know, um, as we uh, as we look at this, when you hear hooves, think uh, think horses. Um, so as you see somebody nauseous, think seasickness, not, uh, uh, you know, arterial gas embolism with a side order of uh, uh, CNS toxicity, you know, certainly, you know, use your, your common sense here. Now, one of the things I want you guys to think about as you guys go through this is it's our responsibility to self-monitor. Diving is the most self-aware sport I know of. There is no other sport that I have been a part of that's nearly this self-aware that there's this many little things that can happen. So with your dive buddy and yourself, it's your responsibility to start looking. So as we start thinking about the, the symptoms and symptoms we talked about, um, convulsions, vision, ears, nausea, twitching, irritability, dizziness, Caleb, you and I are a dive. Which of those signs and symptoms do you think you might notice in me? Um, irritability. Um, I think Caleb's frozen. Brian, I'll pick on you instead. Brian, which of those signs and symptoms do you think you'd, you'd notice in me? Convulsions, vision, ears, nausea, uh, twitching, irritability, and dizziness. We're buddies. Um, I'm, you know, probably the dizziness or irritability, you know, if I ask if you're okay and you give me a really aggressive okay or, you know, you just tell me to, like, buzz off, and then, you know, I might just be, well, something's going on. Hello? Can no, you guys hear me? anyone there? I could hear you, Caleb. Okay. All right, Ben. Be right back. Fun. Okay. So I threw my uh, phone number in the chat. Um, Thanks, please. Chase. Uh, yeah, feel free to add me. Um, I'll send you my my contact card if you want, and then I can also send you my SSI uh, buddy QR po uh, code um, for any of you. Yeah, same. I do wish this chat would let us send uh, pictures. It would be really nice if we could throw our QR codes in there. Yeah. Yep. Uh, just well, keep in mind, my U.S. number is disabled for the next week while well, I'm still in India, but sure. I do receive that message. <laughs> <laughs> have you? What carrier do you have? I'm in. I'm with Verizon. No, oh, because my uh, T-Mobile gives me international texting. Yeah, I have that with Verizon too. It just costs more money. T-Mobile is more affordable in that way. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, it's really out. it's really nice for travel because you get. I mean, it's slower speeds, but you get data and uh, you get data and uh, texting international. Yeah. Yep. Which I guess is technically a bad thing because my work can then contact me and ask me to do things, but. <laughs> Josh, I added you as a buddy on the SSI app. Oh, sorry about that. Did you have my code? Yeah, somewhere. Or I saw it on your instructor card that Ben uploaded when he congratulated oh. you. So just use that. Uh, for this next weekend, I wouldn't mind an extra dive or two. I know I'm I'm going to be at at the um, open water class. If anyone else is there, I wouldn't mind going an extra dive before or after. Perfect. Uh, we can make that happen. All right, let's jump back into this real quick. So, Josh, it was interesting. Um, I asked Josh on, was it Thursday night? Um, I was getting a little on the frustrated side with somebody. I asked Josh, I said, hey, did I seem like I was getting frustrated? I was really working hard not to. And I caught myself and I was able to pull out, out of that. But Josh's response to me is, I dive a lot with you. And I, I noticed that you were heading that way, but you corrected, right? Is that about accurate, Josh? Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. So, Nobody else noticed it, but Josh noticed it. But Josh and I have been dive buddies now for a while. And so it came down to he was able to notice that and, uh, you know, kind of step in and help me a little bit, a little bit more and round things up a little bit. And, and but he noticed it as my dive buddy. And so that's one of the things I want to, you know, kind of pair uh, with you guys as you guys dive with your dive buddies. You will know your dive buddy. I know Nikki really well. We've got tons of dives together. I don't know how many dives because she doesn't log her dives. So, uh, uh um, she logged a couple over the summer, but uh, she has, and then the last time she logged that, what, three or four uh, over the summer. And then the last time before that was February and she logged a couple and then God only knows when before that was as well. So she doesn't log many dives, but we dive a lot. And so she knows me well enough to know if something's going on and she'll ask if I'm off. So as you guys with your dive buddy, I want you to guys take that time and think, yeah, are they acting normal? Do are you know, is, is this right? And then do a self-assessment. How do I feel? I was reading a, uh, I've got the study somewhere. I'll have to find it. Uh, but it was talking about DCS in, in, on remote islands. And there's a barotrauma doctor uh, in, uh, and I want to say it's truck. Um, but she said that 65% of the cases of tourists that come in not feeling well that have been diving are mild symptoms and signs of DCS. Hmm. Loss of appetite, tired, hmm. joint pain, hmm. all signs of severe headaches. All those are signs and symptoms of mild DCS. So hmm. be aware of that. That, you know, if it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Absolutely. So a question for you guys. A, my, a lung rupture can occur uh, with overpressurization in water as shallow as... Less than four feet. Four, four feet. feet. Four feet is exactly the answer. I'm going to uh, give you guys some um, some questions here. I um, as you dive deeper, the narcotic effect of nitrogen gets greater. Greater, absolutely greater. Which of these following statements concerns heat stroke is not true? This is for Joshua. I'm going to go through and ask you each one individually. The skin is hot. Heat stroke is an extremely condition. The pulse rapids or perspiration increases? Perspiration increase, increases. Exactly. All right. I'm, in fact, I'll just share my screen because I actually have these printed. Let's see, windowed. And that one so, was interesting right. to me because perspiration does increase for heat exhaustion, but then it just goes away. It does go away. So Absolutely. for heat stress, it, it increases, and then it gets real concerning when it goes away. Right. Yeah. Once it goes away, you're... It need to definitely worry. Yeah, you're All spraying right. the hospital. Absolutely. Josh or uh, Brian, how many pairs of sinuses does a person have? Four pairs of sinuses. That's exactly right. Uh, Caleb, which of the following symptoms of decompression, which is which of the following is not a symptom of decompression sickness? Sorry. Uh, cyanosis. That's exactly right. Chase, your question is, Hypothermia means a lower than normal. This is a tricky one because it has a 
total body temperature and body core temperature, and it's specific to body core temperature. It is specific to body core temperature. And the, by the way, these are actual test questions. So let's see, Joshua, back to you. A physiological condition called squeeze occurs when? Um, the pressure outside is greater than the internal pressure. Exactly. Good job. Permanent hearing loss, vertigo, ringing in the ears are most likely a result of a ruptured brain? Uh, uh, that would be a rubber arm. I'm sorry, say again? Hold on a sec. Hearing loss, vertigo, ringing in the ears, so... Yeah. So, yeah, no, Chase is right. Thanks for the help. So that would be your semicircular canal, I'm pretty sure. Yep, your round or oval window. Oh, it's okay round. then. Sorry, you were closing in. You were closing <laughs> in. You, were, I, yeah. you would have got it at least in two more tries. I'm gonna make an oval. <laughs> yep. That round or oval window. <laughs> like I said, you would you would have had it in at least two more guesses. <laughs> 50, 50, <90. clears throat> Thanks. All right, Mr. Caleb. And by the way, that that this test repeats quite a few times. It's on the dive guide question, dive guide, dive uh, dive master questionnaire, the assistant instructor, the instructor course as well. So just beware. Um, uh, let's see, Caleb. The primary symptom of ear squeeze in its initial phase is uh, uh, a a pressure that will progress to severe pain if equalized, not complete. There you go. All right, Chase. There are several overexpansion injuries caused by air expanding in the lungs beyond their capacity that you should be aware of so that you can avoid them while diving. These are? Uh, these are air embolism, medial stinal emphysema, subcutaneous emphysema, and pneumothorax. Yep, there you go. All right, Josh. If you have uh, difficulty equalizing pressure in your ears, sinuses while descending, you should? Ascend until the pressure is relieved and then attempt the equalization. Nicely done. Um, even if a diver suffers from decompression sickness at a remote location, you should never, Brian, do what? Recompress the diver underwater. Why? Well, because, I mean, you're taking them, if they're already uh, suffering from it, you don't want to put them back in a more dangerous situation. There you go. This is my favorite one, Caleb. Hypoxic, I, hypoxic hypoxia is far... the the most common form of hypoxia. The, this condition is when? Partial pressure, pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood is too high, too low. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Hy hypoxia. Yeah. Okay. Hyperoxia would be too high. You're right. Yes. I can't get my Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Hypo means low. Hyper. Just think hyperactive. Hyperactive means too much active. Did we lose Ben? We lost Ben. Yeah. He's Hypo Ben. Hypo Ben. And he says he'll be right back. Yeah, Chase, you'll have to give me your card. Your, uh, yeah. On, well, uh, if you go to the SSI app, you should see my request for to be a buddy. I mean, you could be no. a dick and reject me, but. So that's uh, not how it works in the, in the app. You have to scan oh. the QR code. Okay. Um, it's, it's super dumb because you can yeah. add. If everybody throws their numbers in the chat, I'll start a group chat and then we can just all share. Oh, now Ben's growling. Mm -hmm. He says, Burr. Yeah, if you all throw your uh, numbers in the chat, I'll start a group chat and then we can just share our, our uh, contact QRs. I put mine, did you see that? Yes. Okay. So I was curious about that, Caleb. How come you spelled your name one way for this and then another way for your actual name? Yeah. Privacy. It's being recorded. Well, 
<laughs> now I don't know which one's which. <laughs> the private chat is real. Okay. <laughs> I went to go buy a new boat of day, and I forgot. I, I found. A, I took Lucy to the vet. I did everything, but but get a new boat of day. So. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So. Edgy, um, I just want to make sure you guys go through, do your homework. The final exam is online. I won't make you take a paper test. I'm not that mean. Um, and uh, once it's all passed, you guys are all basically passed with uh, science and diving. But I do want to go through a few other things uh, just briefly. And one of those is Josh would like to talk about decompression theory. Uh, ben, I did prepare. Uh, it's not great compared to what you guys have gone through, but I did prepare temperature effects of underwater environment. I'm happy to go through that as well. Okay, let's let's do Josh's real quick since I already called on him, um, and then let's do yours. And Joshua, I'm ready for you. All right, I will. Let's see. Uh, the screen. All right, so I'm going to talk about the saturation and desaturation model. Um, so basically, the saturation and desaturation models are a way of keeping track of how much um, inert gas that we've absorbed. So a good example of this um, is going to be the tables that we learned in open water class. So... Um, for example, if we go, right, if we go to, oh, this is in meters. So if we go 30 meters, right, we can only stay there for five minutes. Um, so this table does have some safety built in, but ultimately you're tracking, you're saying that after five minutes, I have absorbed too much nitrogen or more nitrogen than I want for my safety factor. So the table is a pretty, um, a pretty good thing to go through and be able to use just because it, it gives you that safety to tell you how much, uh, basically how long you can stay at certain depths before you've absorbed too much nitrogen. And then also how long you need to stay on the surface to release that, that nitrogen. Hmm. Um, a lot of so a lot of these things are based are going to be on, based on half times of your gases and your tissue compartments. So as you can see from this graph, the half time for this tissue compartment is five minutes. So every five minutes, you've gone another fifty percent. So the first five minutes you're at fifty, ten minutes you're at seventy five, fifteen you're at eighty seven, and so on. So up to thirty you're at ninety eight point four of your, of your absorption. Um, so the tables, the tables are for sure a great way to do it, but an even better way, um, is a dive computer. So dive computers run on many different algorithms. Um, the favorite is the Bullman algorithm. Um, but there have been others, uh, from time to time that people have, um, developed, um, with some different pros and cons. Um, so there's, there's VPM here, there's RGBM, um, there's DSAT. Um, and then as you can see, there's the different computers use different, um, algorithms and different ways of setting them up. Um, for our diving, we prefer the Bullman, um, and it's, it has different, uh, different half times for 16, 17, uh, of our tissue compartments uh, for our fast and slow tissues. Um, so basically, here's a few other ones. So Workman, we've seen this, Ben kind of went over this a little bit uh, in the last class. Um, but here's Bullman's uh, algorithms D, and this is the one that, uh, that most of our dive computers are gonna run off of. Um, so it's just so important to make sure that we're, we're understanding how our body's on taking nitrogen and off gassing nitrogen so that we're able to keep ourselves safe um, from the illnesses that uh, that Chase mentioned. Um, that's, uh, I mean, that's pretty much it for, um, for it. It's 
I mean, it's just important to buy a computer and to continue your education to make sure that that you actually understand these and understand how your body uh, is affected by the pressures of nitrogen and oxygen and how it off gases. And especially if you're going to go to trimix and helium and other other gases. Um, any questions? No, thank you. No, appreciate it. Yeah, it's great. So overall, the idea was is that different different companies and different groups have come together to try and find ways to make diving safer. Um, so um, like DSAT was uh, commissioned by Patty, for example, and that was their idea of how do we take what's currently happening and reduce the risk and reduce the challenge even more. That's that's really where, where RGBM came in and RGBM2 as well. Reduce gradient bubble model is what that stands for, by the way. Um, and so it's it's probably the more the more common one that you see. Uh, VPM, uh, VBM is another one that, uh, buried, uh, bubble great bubble model is another one that's, uh, very similar in my opinion to RGB and RGBM2. Um, and so what they did is they wanted to figure out how do we make safer? And what it ends up doing is it's great at the first, at the beginning of a dive trip. Um, it, where it really gets sucky is at the end of a dive trip. It just really compresses you through the process. And the more night it's very sensitive to, residual nitrogen in the process so as you start looking at it you start thinking okay what's the difference between them it's basically all overall how they handle um the idea of the residual nitrogen how to and because as we remember through the process what's the most limiting factor in diving residual nitrogen right yep uh, that nitrogen coming out it's certainly not the oxygen i mean we if you think about it we've got you know uh four hours, five hours, 300 minutes of time of, of a, at a pretty high rate of auction um, that we can take before we start worrying about auction toxicity, right? If, as we look at that, it, uh, we've got four hours um, at 200% before we get mild symptoms of pulmonary auction toxicity. But the, the, the first thing that we have to worry about is either nitrogen narcosis or nitrogen um, bubbles, which cause DCS. So nitrogen is the biggest thing that uh, um, we need to be concerned about and worry about as we as we work through this process. So um, that's what they're really trying to model, and they're trying to measure out through the process of of this is how do we monitor and measure and and deal with with that. Um, and as you kind of look through the process, you know the, the um, Bullman has been by far the most successful. Where Bullman starts to go off track for most people is when they start to abuse Bullman. For example, I know an instructor trainer um, that, uh, and while well, he should know better, believes fully in in pile and, and pile stops, which he doesn't understand anything. Will also do six days, and he'll do reverse profile dives. Bullman is not designed to effectively manage that many dives in a day, as well as doing a reverse profile. You're essentially taking away and bro breaking the breaking the algorithm. It just doesn't know what to do um, through the process. So as we kind of came came through the process of, of kind of figuring this out, this back in the uh, early 1900s, um, Haldine, Haldine came together and he said, we've got to figure this out. We've got to find a Oh, he's going to be so angry. <laughs> Josh, I thought he said he got a new a new modem. He no, he up. just so he had a he had a modem modem router switch Wi-Fi unit, okay. and he got new access points. So or he got a new mesh points. Mm. So he offloaded the uh, the other stuff, but his modem still cuts out. But his Wi-Fi. His Wi-Fi doesn't, so it comes back a lot faster, but his modem still keeps on crapping out on him. Mm. Why does it default to me? I don't understand that. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're purposely in the list right now. Yeah. <laughs> I decided you're the most photogenic out of all of us. 
So that is not true. But <laughs> fact, <I'm> trying to <laughs> feel better. <laughs> Hopefully, you guys all got a text. I included Mike Merrill in this um, just because he's he's you know picking up the kids. Uh, but I went ahead and shared my QR code. Please feel free to add me uh, as a buddy. I'd love to add you guys. Um, but if you didn't get any of that information, just let me know. I will turn on Wi-Fi calling so I can get the text. Mm -hmm. Ooh, now I have, how do I have three Josh Batulos in my contact information? I don't know. That's frankly too many Josh's. Delete that one. You can never have too many Josh's. I don't know. I don't know. My I brother's name is Josh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used your QR code, Josh, to add you as a buddy. Yeah. The, the thing is that I've got on Mac and all my text messages can go on my Mac computer so I can still take a picture of them and add you as a buddy. But, you know, if somebody sends something to my phone with a QR code and it doesn't pop up on my Mac, I can't take a picture of it to add it as my buddy. It's stuck on my picture taking device. Oh, I well, I can see all my photos and text messages on my computer. Okay. Yeah. I still have to log my dives from this weekend and yeah, I got like, ugh. okay. All right. I uh, reset my Rotom while I was at it as well. Cause maybe that was, maybe that'll help, but I'm getting to Rotom tomorrow. That's that'll fix that. Anyway, uh, jump back into it. So we're in the 1900s and, and uh, we're trying to figure this issue out. So, uh, J.S. Haldane was a, uh, a physicist and, and a scientist at the time. And, and what he started going through the process is he figured out that there's a correlation of pressure and the air chemicals, we're the air that we're breathing. And, and basically he came up with criticals, uh, the critical difference of two to one. When the pressure is twice, um, that uh, we we now know that there's there's a potential issue. We need to allow that pressure to resume back to normal. And so as we started going through this process, he kind of understood the idea of graded value, that this pressure point needs to be reduced. It's kind of like a boiling pot. You don't uh, just take the top off automatically. You let the pressure reduce, and then you take the process off um, so that you're able to work, work it down. And so he, he came up with this idea, and, and it, was very, very, uh, it was very astute, if you really will. Um, and he was also uh, part of the idea that came up with the, the general idea of what the M value was and started mapping this magical M value. Well, as we kind of came along that process, uh, we realized that uh, Haldine was close um, in this idea. And he, he'd come up with decompression models that contained five compartments with half times from five to 75 minutes. Now the workman model came along a little bit later and the workman model contained nine compartments with um, half times ranging from five to 240 minutes. And so you can start getting the idea that, um, that we're starting to fine tune this idea and we'll get the idea that something's going on here and we need to allow ourselves time to reduce the pressure on that boiling pot or just the spaghetti flies everywhere, right? And so as we start moving this across, Workman also came up with the idea that, wait a minute, Haldine was close. You're on the right track um, and you're thinking about this in the right way, but we need to think about this more granular, granularly. And while he had, he changed the high point of half tissues from 75 minutes to 240 minutes, he also realized that the composition of the gas we're breathing has something to do with this as well. And it wasn't the entire gas that was the problem. It was only part of the gas. And so Workman came up with the idea and he said, wait a minute, Let's focus on this. Is it the oxygen? Oxygen? Well, yes and no. It's in this particular case, no. We know that uh, 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 Smith has been studying the the oxygen portion of this and doing a great job of that, and we have the time. What else can we blame it on? Let's blame it on the nitrogen. And he's, they determined it was the nitrogen in the mix. And so uh, Workman came along, and he came up with Workman's critical difference. And while this was later proven to be wrong, it's still close enough for this uh, for government work for this class. 
um, that Workman's Critical Difference basically said, okay, yes, it's a two to one ratio, but not the way you're thinking. Um, what they're basically saying is Workman's Critical Difference is a critical difference in the partial pressure of the nitrogen. So when the nitrogen gets to a two to one difference, then we start having issues. So this is where we get the idea of nitrox being so um, incredibly important because if we're breathing 79% nitrogen, it gets to twice that pressure at 158% at 33 feet. But if we're breathing 50% nitrox, and I'm just using easy numbers, you guys aren't certified except Josh here soon to breathe more than 50% nitrox. Uh, it's just an easy number. At 50% nitrox, that means we have 50% nitrogen, right? And at 50% nitrogen at 33 feet, that's only 100% nitrogen. So that's still not over the 158, the critical difference. So with we're breathing 50%, that means we can literally get to how deep on 50% before we get to a critical difference of 158. So about 70 feet. Is that about right? Yeah, that's about right. About it's about 70 feet, roughly. If, for round numbers and for our uh, argument today, so 50%, we can be at um, 40 feet and we haven't hit the critical difference. Thus, we reduce that potential for DCS considerably. And that's where Robert Workman came in. Now, uh, while work, uh, Workman, Robert Workman was working, and by the way, Robert Workman was a Navy uh, Navy scientist. He was and ended as a rear admiral for your useless information. Um, and he was working for uh, NETO, uh, Naval Experiment and Diving Unit. Um, another physicist uh, and physician was working. Uh, and this was Professor, um, and his name was Albert Bullman, in case you're wondering. He was conduct conducting decompression research in Switzerland. And he developed two very popular models that are still widely distributed through the community today. And his models differed from Workman um, in that they contained even more compartments um, and their M values were based on a on zero absolute pressure. Now, Bullman ZHL16 compartments had nitrogen half times ranging from four to 635 minutes. Now, ZHL16 algorithm is widely used in desktop uh, dive planning software and personal dive computers today. Um, we're currently on the Charlie version of that. Now, if you look through the versions of that, what you'll find is um, that they did split compartments one um, into two parts, so 1A and 1B. So in technicality, if you really count it that way, tissue compartment uh, one being split, now we actually have 17 tissue compartments. Um, but that's a, a deeper trivia question that you guys probably ever wanted to get into. But it gives you the kind of the idea as you start looking at the models that they wanted to find a way to keep tuning this and tuning this to the point that uh, we could get this to the most accurate point. And um, by far, uh, Bullman 16C is the most common um, algorithm used in, in all diving today. Um, and it's fairly recent as well. I mean, we're talking um, mid to late 90s was when the Charlie version came out. So if you really want to get into kind of an interesting uh, idea, where we're out in decompression models is still relatively young. We didn't start really using Trimix until the late 80s um, and, and Nitrox as well. And that's what it was starting to experiment upon. And it was fairly eclectic and only the scientific people are doing it um, and it eventually caught on. And so what's interesting, kind of follow the progression of these gases. I mean, we if you go back to one of my lectures that I, um, I have on Teach Me to Dive, I've got a great one with um, uh, Dan Orr. And he talks about being some of the first people Per, uh, to dive trimix in caves for deep diving. So we can actually talk to somebody that lives in our local area that was part of the team that was helping to develop trimix. That's pretty he was cool. actually on the team that actually helped develop the first dive computer. So in essence, while everything is older than Josh, um, it, overall, <laughs> it's, um, it's still relatively new. It's still within you know, the last 50 years that this has really happened. So it's it's been a pretty amazing progress to go through this process. So the big thing to kind of understand is as we start talking about this and understanding these tissue compartments at half times, think about it like this. Is that as I have a sponge, if it's 100% full and I squeeze out half of it, it's 50% dry, drier now. And then I can squeeze out half again 
it's I've got it. I've got it half of that out. Now it's 75% dry and a half again and half again and half again and half again. We can do that seven times over the course of a dynamic. And that's what a half time is, is we're saying that our, our tel- cell tissue will decrease by 50% and become safer. And then it'll decrease by 50% again and become safer. So we're looking for the de- decrease decreased partial pressure in the, in the tissue compartment of 50%. That's what we're looking for. So does that make sense, guys? Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. So I'm going to skip nitronarcosis. I think we've covered nitronarcosis to, to the nth degree. I think you guys have a pretty sharp understanding of how a dive computer helps in this situation as well. Um, but I am going to pull up one of my open water presentations. Uh, no, I'm not, because you you have all seen this, except for Caleb hasn't seen this. So uh, open recent, open water <laughs> like this oh, a lot. No. Uh, okay. Just take me a second to find it. There it is. All right. So as we look through this, look at this uh, share screen. <coughs> this is an actual dive Nikki and I did together in Hawaii. Two hours and 18 minutes at 40 feet. Is this dive possible? Got the dive table right there. Yes or no, guys? 40 feet. Uh, two hours. What? No. No. Well, two hours, 18 minutes. No. You're limited to two hours and 10 minutes. Based on the, yeah, based on the dive table, no. Yeah, but the are limits no. two hours and 10 minutes. So it's absolutely not possible. But here's the beautiful thing about a dive computer is it's designed to monitor your nitrogen uptake. So here's the overall dive in reality. My wife and I do, we got down, we kissed 40 feet, we came up to 31 feet, we went back down, we came back up to 30 feet, we stayed about 35 feet, 38 feet, up to about 28 feet, down and up and down and up. There's a lot of time we don't spend at 40 feet. Two yeah. hours and 18 minutes of this, and there's a quick pop to check navigation. We'd been kicking around at 20 feet for so long that we didn't even have a, a safety stop to do, right? So yeah. now, as we look at this, my average depth was 28 feet. So my ab- nitrogen absorption was really based upon an average of 28 feet. So now, 28 feet for two hours and 18 minutes, is that possible? Oh, yeah. Easily. Yeah. There's your benefit to a dive computer. The dive computer's primary goal in life for you is to utilize the Bowman table or whatever table that you're using in your computer. If you're, uh, I think all of us are using the same one. If you're using Bowman to monitor based upon an algorithmic idea, what our nitrogen absorption is, that's what it really does. Um, it has a lot of cool stuff. It tells you what depth you're, it'll tell you what depth you're at because it's measuring utilizing that depth to monitor the amount of nitrogen absorption. It'll monitor your time and it's utilizing that to help utilize the algorithm to monitor your, your nitrogen absorption. It'll tell you your temperature, which doesn't help that at all, but uh, it'll tell you your gas, but those are add-on features. Those are not what it was designed for. The original dive computers were designed by the Navy in um, cooperation with the Scripps Institute and the Naval Experimental Diving Unit to mm-hmm. allow the divers in the Navy uh, to be more tactical. And the first dive computers that came out were top secret. They were just for the Navy. And the Navy um, was very keen on this idea that we wanted to be able to give our frogmen, uh, for lack of, uh, you know, just for that general term, the ability to accomplish a mission safely for longer periods of time, more accurately, without having to send them to the corpsman. They still That's use really- the dive computers. Say again? They still use their own dive computers. Oh, yeah, if you absolutely. Look at the dive manual, they talk about how they use their own brand, essentially, of dive computers. I mean, another company makes them, but they're proprietary to the Navy. And they use the same ZHL 16C oh, yeah. dive tools, but the gradient oh, yeah. fact is pre-programmed for oh, Yeah, them. it's a tactical polygic. Um, um, absolutely. It, it absolutely is. But um, it's specific to the Navy. But it's still a, a tactical computer designed for that. But the original ones were designed to be tactical. Um, they were top secret, sec- uh, secret. And so it's kind of interesting as you go through this process. <coughs> uh, 
uh, process. So it's kind of interesting to, to, to look at this and get this idea. So that's what your dive computer is doing. It's designed for really one key thing. And that one key thing is to keep, keep you safe by monitoring the amount of residual nitrogen. That's what it's doing for you. Make sense? Yep. Makes sense. Absolutely. So let's see. Escape. There we go. Try to get out of the, go back over to the dive computer. So that's the dive computer him, uh, history. Now it, it, it's intended to use this to monitor your, your, uh, your nitrogen uptake, but it has key limitations. Now be aware as you start dealing with dive computers, you know, does, does your dive computer monitor altitude? A lot um, of them do. Mine does, some, yeah. of, some of them have to be set for that as well. For example, if you're using the Sunto, it has to be set for that. And it's not super accurate when it comes to that. It has a range. It sets it between this and this with a factor on it. The Apex does a very nice job measuring and measure by atmospheric pressure. So does the Sunto, or so does, the, I'm sorry, not the Sunto, but the Shearwater and the, the Garmin as well. Um, they monitor by actual atmospheric pressure. So, you know, get an idea of what that looks like and make sure that you're diving uh, safe. So as you go through this process, um, and but it does have other limitations as well. It won't monitor and adjust the algorithm based upon cold. I wish it would. I wish it, if it saw water temperature at 60 degrees, that it added a, an additional safety factor to it. If it saw it at 50 degrees, it increased that safety factor. It would be a simple thing to do, right? So, so can I ask you this? Uh, yes. What What do you normally set your gradient factor for in warm weather? In warm weather, fifty eighty five is pretty typical. How do you adjust it for, say, ice diving? Um, I take it down to uh, seventy to seventy five. Okay. I typically Seven? just so you only adjust the high. I only adjust the high. The okay. the low. Now, here's the thing is it takes quite a bit for the, the low um, gradient factor to set in. Yeah. Gradient factors are, are work like this. But let's, we'll jump right into that. Gradient factors are basically designed um, that gradient factor low um, is the depth of your first stop. Okay. When you hit 50% of your M value, what's going to happen is your gradient factor is going to kick in and slow you down and then create an algorithmic build between 50 to your final gradient factor high gradient factor yeah. high number determines the length of your last stop. Okay. That's why a gradient factor 30 is so scary because you're getting, you have, it's forcing you to have a safety margin of 70% at your stop point. Yeah. So if you're doing a 70% stop point, then the key to remember that is, is that it's stopping you way too soon. So what's ended up happening is you're having far more on gassing than you're having on gassing. It's stop, and the, the challenge is, is it's picking one of those 16 compartments, which yeah. is taking the lead tissue compartment, the one that has the highest amount of saturation, and it's yeah. stopping it based upon the lead tissue compartment. So, okay. so fast, your fast compartment's off gassing, but your slowest compartment's still probably on gassing. Absolutely, and the majority of your uh, your slow tissues are uh, still on gassing. So yeah. that's why taking it to fifty percent. Now, truthfully, you could run an eighty five eighty five. Yeah, it's going to let you out of the water until there's a fifteen percent safety margin. Yeah. The reason for the lower the lower first number is it allows your body to adjust more slowly to that point. It's not suddenly taking you to that point and then taking you out of the water. It's allowing the gas to come off more slowly, more conservatively over a course of time. So instead of you rowing from here to, or, or running from here to, you know, wherever at 25 miles an hour, it's allowing you to run at five miles an hour to build okay. and build enough steam, right? Yeah. To that, it's, it's allowing your body to repair itself and, and go a little slower and ease into the hot water, right? If you will. Yeah. So that's what that's what a gradient factor does. It allows you to ease into that, build a safety margin. So uh, a typical um, a typical starting divers will start at uh, 50, 75, uh, 50, uh, 50, 80 in that area. Um, yeah. I know mine for warm weather because I measure it. Yeah. Um, Nick, Nick and I have uh, the O dive, and so we actually measure ourselves on when we go for bigger dives. We actually go out and measure ourselves based upon actual bubble calculation. So yeah. Okay. 
So it's uh, kind of interesting, interesting uh, overall. So some of the other limitations that these I've computers have is the algorithms designed to work forwards, not backwards, if that makes any sense to you at all. Um, cars uh, tend to drive better forward than reverse. Same thing with, with dive computers. So as we start talking about multi-level diving, um, dive computers are very limited on reverse profile. They are oh. just not designed to handle it well. So uh, because the, and it's because the algorithm's not designed to handle a reverse profile. It's not designed to, it's, uh, and oddly enough, it's also not designed to handle a reverse thermoclimb either. So as you start getting, if you do get into that, that, that challenge, we are, are doing a, a, a reverse thermal climb, then, um, you know, one second. Yeah. David, drop my, drop it off my keys. Sorry. But, uh, as you start getting your reverse profile, and interestingly enough, I, I, I have a friend that was doing research in a cave um, sump in Florida where they had a very high reverse thermal climb. They were getting down to, uh, it was like two or 300 feet. I want to say it was 300 feet and to this hot springs. And at the hot springs, it was 105 degrees at 300 feet, which is very weird. It was cold at the surface, so they were having to wear dry, uh, dry suits and protection uh, from zero to 100 feet. And then they were getting into a, um, an a, a habitat and then taking all that off and getting into the swim, swim clothes and, and diving down so they wouldn't get overheated. They actually had to go to University of Florida and create a, a specific bubble model and decompression model based upon the reverse thermocline. So it was really interesting as you get through it. <coughs> so because unfortunately, dive computers are not designed um, to handle that at all. So it's one of the reasons we don't encourage that. So be very careful as you do these that you always dive your deepest dive first. Make sense? Yep. All right. Makes sense. Uh, uh, I don't feel like we need to get into buoyancy compensators, weighting systems. I feel like you guys have got a pretty good understanding of that. Um, uh, we could talk about safety dive kits, but I think you guys have a pretty good understanding of that and don't need to talk about that. Um, so we have one more presentation, uh, and that would be Mr. Caleb. I'm... Anxiously excited to hear your presentation, Caleb. <laughs> Let's hope my internet holds out here. I've got a backup on my phone in case I lose internet. So we'll see how this goes. This is not going to be as good as Chase or Ben, but I'm very interested in your feedback. I'll share my screen. All right. Can you see the temperature effects of an underwater environment slide? Not yet. Nope, just your pretty face. Yeah, it's going. There we go. There you go. There we go. Sorry, I have to add it. It's me adding it. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So this is going to be short and sweet, and I'm not going to go super deep on some of the things because we've already done that. So with an underwater environment, there is a lot to consider when with regards to temperature. Um, the so I want to cover like what are the dynamics in uh, an underwater environment with, with regards to temperature specifically, I'm going to keep it focused on that here. Um, how does that affect us as divers and how can we plan, um, and equip and prepare to react in situation or be even before we dive, uh, with regards to how temperature, uh, changes and what that temperature, how that temperature affects us as divers. So, um, I, I, uh, I do computers for a living. That's what I tell people, <laughs> network engineer. Um, and I, uh, as a kid, I was building my own computers. Has anyone ever built a gaming computer or some, some high performance computer that you have at home? Okay. I see a couple hands. Yep. So when you build a computer, uh, you can there, you always want to think about cooling. How do you cool it down? Uh, the, and if you can, uh, uh, manage the temperature, if you can manage the, the thermal uh, output of that chip, that, that processor, you can get more performance out of it. So with uh, when you're building a computer, one thing you can do, the best kind of, uh, the, the most efficient cooling is actual liquid, liquid, liquid cooling. And then when I started my professional career, I got to actually work in a data center where we were doing exactly this. The literally the servers are submerged in liquid. Now it's not water, obviously. Uh, because that would cause electrical issues, but it is a 
water-like liquid, usually some sort of oil that does not conduct electricity, but it, it really does help to off, uh, offload that thermal load on the computers. So the same thing applies to us as divers. When we Now, we want to stay warm, so it's the opposite of the computer, but the water will pull the heat away from us uh, much more effectively than air. If you're running, you know, your computer's running and you got that fan going, it will cool it down, but not as good as if you have a liquid cooling system on your computer. Just don't dunk your laptop in water. I don't recommend that. Will not work. Trust me, I've tried it. <laughs> Long story. <laughs> So as we're, as we're diving, the, the water will pull the heat away from us at, I think it's like 25 times, at least 25 times faster, some maybe even more, like sometimes maybe 30, 40 times uh, more. Uh, it'll, it, will, it will wick that heat away from us, convect that heat away from us um, in the water, but air will be a lot better uh, or it will, it's a better, it's a more, it, air will cool us down, but not as much as as water will. The other thing about water is it takes a lot more energy to warm up the water. So as we think about exposure systems, so I'm going to talk about wetsuits and dry suits here for a second. Um, as you're, uh, so I've, we all dry, dived here at Ryrie. Some of us have done dry suits. Has anyone here done both dry suit and wetsuit at Ryrie? Yes. I guess <laughs> not, not at the same time. time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so Ryrie is very cold. Uh, some, some of you, you know, like Josh and Ben, you guys have done both. <laughs> um, I've only done wetsuit there, but a wetsuit will have a layer of water inside of it. Uh, that's the way it's designed. And it's, and that's, that water is intended to be, uh, to warm up a little bit and then be that, that to provide some of that warmth. That's great and all, but because water takes so much more energy to, to, to heat up, if that water is super cold and if it's constantly flushing through, there's a limit to how far the wetsuit can go when it comes to keeping us warm. Whereas a dry suit, you can add layers, you have more flexibility, you can go to a, uh, a lower temperature uh, because you're dealing, hopefully, assuming you don't end up with a punctured suit like Ben has a few times, as he's told us, <laughs> you can stay warmer because it is you're dealing with a layer of air in there. You can also have more flexibility with what other layers you add inside a wetsuit. Now, I haven't done a dry suit yet. Um, I am looking forward to doing that at some point in the future here. Um, I have been told, I haven't taken it yet, but I've been told that the dry suit uh, diving specialty is uh, definitely something to add to your training list from SSI. Um, so I'm looking forward to do that as, uh, as soon as I am able to get a dry suit. So as we think about the effects of temperature on us as we are diving. We've already covered uh, the hypothermia and hyperthermia. Um, but just for a quick, quick overview here, uh, it hypothermia, which is the, dec the, I, the decrease of body temperature, core body temperature, uh, can happen pretty quickly, uh, even in a warm climate, uh, when you would think the water is, oh, it's great. You go down to a deeper level, um, or you are, uh, you, uh, the water un at, at is just lower than you expect. Even if it's a few degrees lower than what you would feel comfortable many hours of that, it starts to get a little bit cold. I was diving in Fiji. The water was pretty warm, but I was the only one with a wetsuit on the rest of the, the team did not. And by the next day, everyone had wetsuits on because they were like, yeah, after six hours in the water, <laughs> I'm too cold. No one got hypothermia, of course, or fortunately, but uh, it does start to weigh on you after you're in the water for a, a, a long time. Now, a question. If you're diving, this is one thing I was thinking about. If you're diving with your buddy and they start to have hypothermia under the water, what are some observable symptoms that you can think of that you might be able to start to detect that uh, there is at least an issue, even if you can't narrow it down to that? Any ideas? For hypothermia, I'd be looking for rapid breathing, you know, just just struggling mm -hmm. to keep their breath, looking for the lots of bubbles discharging from the regulator. You know, they're going to have low gas real fast. Hmm. Any other thoughts? Flooding. Shivering. Maybe that they would. Oh, go ahead. Oh, just shivering. Shivering. Yep. Hyper or hypo? Hypo, hypo, so okay. decrease. Never mind, never mind the, the breathing rate. No, I was thinking hyper. I thought you said hyper. Sorry, 
<laughs> yeah, so, so a decrease in body, yes, shivering. Now, I, that's actually a question I have. I have not heard people saying that the breathing rate, because you do have shallower breathing when you are, when your body temperature is, is decreasing, but I don't know if it's increased. It, actually, I think, actually, my slide says slow, so yeah. <laughs> it's slower breath. It's suppressed. Um, yes. Fatigue. Um, I've heard people say, I haven't observed this personally, but I have heard people talk about they've noticed their their buddy or they personally felt much tighter. Uh, they started shivering and then it just got really tired. And um, that was something that's observable underwater. So um, if you have hypothermia or if you someone in your dive group, you know, obviously the best, the earlier treatment is to get dry and get warm as quickly as possible. Drink something warm uh, as soon as you can. Uh, don't don't go past your safety stop if you need to get out of the water. Try to don't 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 add one problem to another. <laughs> it's because you're freezing. Um, but uh, get to the boat, get dry, uh, and uh, you know as much warmth as possible. I've heard divers talk about when they come out of a cold environment, they have a a, a, a um, uh, a warm uh, sleeping bag on hand on a boat or something to uh, uh, to have on hand in case they need that. It's very warm and drink warm liquids. So for hyperthermia, so this is the increase. And this one I've actually observed, oddly enough, we don't talk about this as much in these classes, but uh, on a dive trip recently, there was a gentleman uh, in our group, not part of, not not a gentleman I knew, but he was diving with the group and he actually got too warm on the boat uh and he his he was uh he wasn't drinking enough that's one thing you need to be uh, hydrated that can help with hyperthermia uh, increase uh, of body temperature but he was wearing a two his wetsuit was pretty thick uh, it was pretty warm already it was in the sun he didn't take it off and kind of cool down he was just sitting there and and next thing you know he was he was uh um, sweat. Now he just got into heat exhaustion. He wasn't in the stroke. So he started, uh, sweating heavily skin felt moist, cold. Um, and he started getting dizzy. That was when he was like, man, why am I dizzy? Is this like, I've been on the boat all day. I haven't, I'm not, haven't felt dizzy. You know, he thought he was motion sickness or something. And the dive guide's like, dude, you need to cool down <laughs> like here, drink some water and, you know, take your suit off halfway at least or whatever. Um, or get in the water. Uh, he, he actually ended up sitting on the side of the boat cause we were on a, on a, uh, surface interval. So we were sitting on the boat for a couple hours and he just sat in the water, cooled down. He felt better pretty quickly. Fortunately, he didn't start vomiting or anything like that. So think about this as we're planning the dive, uh, is the surface conditions going to be too warm? Uh, it's more, more, it's more likely for hyperthermia to be, um, on the surface before or after a dive. Any questions? So just to overview, uh, think about the temperature before you go diving. Think about what you're going to wear. Think about plan your, uh, your exposure system. In my experience, it's easier to rent gear. If you're on a trip, it's not as easier to rent exposure systems, a suit that fits you, that fits your needs, uh, especially when you get into the dry suit stuff. So always have your own gear. If you can, uh, get certified in dry suit, if you want to go to those more extreme options, um, and. Uh, think about the conditions during, before, during, and after the dive. I, I did have one question for you, if that's all yes. right. Um, did you happen to look into if there are differences in the rate at which heat is conducted away from a body in salt water versus fresh water? I did not. That's a good question, actually. I don't think it's a major difference, but... My understanding is that fresh water, the fresher the water is, the higher it actually conducts heat away uh, from the body. So we being freshwater, primarily freshwater divers, are mm -hmm. probably a little more susceptible to those rapid uh, thermal changes. Um, mm -hmm. Again, if somebody is smarter than me, and that's most of you, that's all of you, um, please feel free to correct me on that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about in the water, but I know for computers and stuff, the you want to use distilled water and stuff, not only because it's conductive, but because it has less minerals and stuff in it, which allows the transfer yeah. to be better. No, I conduct all my computers in salt water. <laughs>
All your water cooled computers, Chase? Yeah, they don't work anymore. I don't know why. <laughs> we lose Ben. Looks like it. <laughs> no, good presentation. I really appreciate it. Sorry about that. I was so muted. Uh, a couple comments. Uh, hypo hypothermia is something we'll definitely deal with a fair amount around here overall. Um, definitely dealt with it more than once and uh, through the process. So one of the things we do during ice diving is uh, we have a heated tent. I have an ice tent and uh, we put a heater in it uh, to make sure we have it somewhere to go get warm. It's it's a very mm -hmm. common thing. Um, this last year, I taught four separate sessions. And so that ice tent was worth its weight in gold. I think I spent uh, 300 bucks on it or something. I was really, really happy I purchased it. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, what you'll find is more diving is limited by cold around here than anything else. Um, as you start feeling that cold, you'll typically feel in your toes, your fingers first. Um, so keeping your face, head, hands, and feet warm are amazing mm -hmm. how much more warm it will keep your body. So, for example, mm -hmm. this last year, we switched over to FFMs uh, for our ice diving. I got um, at least 20 to 30% more time out of my ice dives. Um, I don't think I had less than two hours of uh, bottom time per session. So I had eight hours of bottom time um, ice diving this year, which if you think about it, that's actually that's a fair amount, right, um, of overall bottom time. Um, in just ice, in just ice, I that makes you a cool dude. <laughs> Fair enough, absolutely. Um, I did get hypothermia last year, um, and uh, during a, a dive, um, it wasn't this season; it was last season. We were um, Nikki and I uh, did our first dive in Yellowstone the day after the ice came off the lake. Um, oh. It was literally the day after, and uh, so the water temp was thirty three degrees. Um, and, uh, we got it in, uh, we did a, uh, it was a Thursday afternoon dive and, uh, late afternoon and we got in and we were doing some aspires and I had a micro leak in my dry glove and it was about a hole smaller than that. It was, it was a, about the size, uh, half the size of a pin, right? It was very small and I felt a, dr a trickle in and I just thought I hadn't put my glove on well enough because I had oval gloves and I tried to adjust it and I felt that tremor in and I could feel the sharpness of the cold water coming in my arm. And eventually I lost feeling in my arm, which should have been an indicator, but I didn't want to ruin her dive. And, and I'm, I'm stupid like that. Right. And so one of the things that I do during all dives and all dives and not so some dives, not part of my dives, all dives is I do cognitive checks throughout the dive. It's just me, especially um, the type of dives that I like to do where I'm doing decompression dives, doing de these, you know, 150s, 170s, uh, where I'm doing, you know, uh, uh, more exotic, where I'm doing, uh, and I've got, you know, one decompression blend or two decompression blends uh, that I'm having to go through this process and be aware of it, that uh, I'm, I'm, I have to be aware because, I mean, nitrogen narcosis is a real thing. Hy hypothermia is a real thing. And so I'm doing my my kind of cognitive check, and I, I couldn't do the math. I was, I was at 50 feet, and I was trying to figure out how long it was going to take me to get to the surface. And with a three minute safety stop. And I couldn't do the math. I couldn't figure out 50 feet at three, 30 feet per minute plus three minutes. I just, I couldn't do it. And I realized, uh, and it just was, it was beyond me. And so I just tapped, tapped Nikki. And all I could come up with was I'm done. I'm going up. And, uh, and I started by, I headed up and I just thankfully just, I had enough presence of mind, just follow the computer. Don't think mm -hmm. Follow the computer. And that's my rule of thumb anyways. The computer's smarter than I am. Follow the computer. And I, I got to the surface uh, finally. Um, I, I hit my safety stop at 20 feet, and the boat came over top of me. Um, and I had presence of mind, just keep following the thing. If you follow the thing, I could hear the boat. And finally, the boat passed, and my safety stop cleared. And I popped up, and I watched the boat that was about 75 feet past me. And I swam to shore. When I got the dry suit off, and I got my shirt off, and I got my uh, my uh, garments off. I was blue from my left on my whole left side of my body. My arm, my chest was blue, um, wow. and so it's a real thing. I mean, you lose cognitive ability, you lose your ability. So I I say this a lot, but as you feel going in the water is how you should come out of the water. But check yourself during the dive. Do basic Ooh. things while on decompression dives um, and uh, um, cold dives and most dives and bigger dives. I go through what one two three four four three two one. Four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four. Um, I'm at 60 feet, 30 feet per minute, plus a five-minute safety stop should be how long? Seven minutes, right? 
Um, do those basic cognitive checks with yourself. Do simple math. I've been diving for 45 minutes I um, and I'm going through X amount of gas. How much more time do I have left? How mm -hmm. much, you know, what direction uh, did I come from? What direction should I be going? Mm -hmm. Check in with yourself. Uh, make sure that you understand where you're at. And the only way to do that is cognitive checks. Make mm -hmm. sure that you're checking in on yourself. So I just can't speak highly enough of don't be afraid. Most divers out there are grab a tank, jump in the water, come out at some point when I, I get close to 700 PSI. Don't be that mm. diver. The difference between a technical diver and an open water diver is what, Joshua? The planning and hover. The planning and the hover. Absolutely. <laughs> Skill. Absolutely. But the planning. Mm. Be that diver that pre-plans everything that checks in with yourself on a regular basis, that checks in on yourself during the dive, before the dive, mm -hmm. and after the dive. Be that diver. So check in with yourself. So, um, and, uh, so hyperthermia, when you get too hot, here's what you say when you're on the boat if you start feeling um, overheated. Captain, I need a prop check. <laughs> that actually... What that means is that you want to get off the boat and in, into about waist deep worth of water, mm. but it allows you to get in the water. So they'll turn the, they, they will absolutely stop the boat and make sure the engine's off, give you a line and let you jump in the water. It's really because you want to urinate, but it's also a nice way if you're, um, if you're feeling overheated, just ask for a prop check. That's your magic term of the day um, that you need to pop in and do a prop check. So you guys, <laughs> something, something about dive boats today as well. <laughs> so that that is absolutely a thing i've done more than my share of prop checks so um because I'm, i promise you the last thing you ever want to be is on a uh, in a dive boat head that is the the, uh. the most <laughs> place in the world oh it's bad. yeah the things that happen in there are, uh yeah so anyway other than that what questions do you guys have we went through a lot there's a little bit longer class but you guys done amazing um, I'm going to have questions and I'm just going to text you. Like there's going to be questions that come up. Please do. I really and work hard to make sure I answer all. I'm going to text this whole group. I put together a group chat. I'm going to text the group because it's, if I've got the question, I'm sure somebody else has the question or doesn't realize they have the question yet, but no, this was a good class. Totally agree. Same here. I learned a lot. Good. 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 You guys have done amazing. Um, and uh, so I need to send out paperwork to Caleb and Brian. So I will get that. And Brian, I will get that off probably in the morning if that's okay with you since it's, it's nine o'clock at night. Other than that, you guys have done a great job. Caleb, what's the, what's the most interesting thing you've learned through this class? Oh, boy. Um, I think overall it's the realization that there's a lot more under the surface of like, you know, we have these charts and the computers and, and stuff that make it fairly simple, uh, for recreational diving, but realizing there's a lot more under the surface there, uh, that I don't even feel like, like I've, I've, I've actually rewatched the first two classes already and I'm going to go back and watch them again because I feel like I'm, uh, I'm still trying to grasp those lower level details. And I know you mentioned some of the XR courses will actually add more to that too. So it might take me a little while, but eventually get there as well. Um, and the more I understand that it's like, it's like nice. Like I can, I feel like I can fall back on the safety, uh, the, the convenience of the charts, the computers, et cetera, that just kind of do the, the, a lot of it for us. But yet the more I understand of what those things are doing for me, both I appreciate it as well as, um, learning to 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 check for the safety margins for myself and be like okay i, I know what's happening here i know what's, what's going on um and i can trust that system even more because of that or know where that system's limitations are so overall that's been one thing for me cool brian what'd you learn what's the most interesting thing you learned um with just how much math there is involved with diving i mean you know obviously there was a little bit um that we went over in open water, but more in nitrox, talking about uh, calculating best blends and max operating depth. But the sheer of math that's involved actually has my left brain kind of going a little crazy. Um, and it's just, 
it's it's like a problem to solve. Not that scuba diving so much is a problem, but you, you know, it's that unknown to try and figure out to uh, get the best experience out of it, which I really. Right. The good news is the math is actually fairly simple. It's and it's the same math over and over again. It's it's a basic algebraic equation. Sometimes you solve for x, sometimes you solve for y. <laughs> it really is. It's it's more simple than you think. And it's funny once you get the basic idea and understanding of it, and you've practiced it a few times. Even this weekend, um, I, I had my I, I, uh, Sunday. I had to uh, do a quick analyzation on a tank that I had. And so I did the quick analyzation on the tank, and then I did the math uh, real quickly with a calculator. Um, it took me, Josh, did you even notice me doing the math on, um, on my tank? Uh, I don't remember when that would be, so probably no. So it was that quick. Uh, <clears throat> I figured it out real quick, boom, 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 had it done. I didn't have to pull a chart. I, I, generally, I don't. it's pretty rare for me to pull a chart for myself. I pull it for you guys to show you that you can use it, but I'd rather mm. you do the math, to be honest with you. Mm. Uh, apparently, write a Python program for it for some of our <laughs> people. <laughs> Somebody will never put that down. Josh, what's the most interesting thing you've learned through science of diving? I just really like how this course just kind of tied everything together. I mean, I've taken a lot of courses up to this point, and it just kind of goes in depth as to why we do things and actually gives the, the math and science behind it. Right on. Chase, how about you? Um, I would say for me, decompression theory, I find fascinating. I really, really am interested in it. And, and it's this class really emphasizes the fact that it is only a theory and, and we have to use what we've learned to accompany that theory in order to make ourselves safe. And so uh, between the decompression theory and, uh, you know, math calms me down so i enjoy the math very much and like you said it is just a rearrangement of the same equation over and over um i i i would like to do a little bit more practice uh in developing handwritten dive plans you know i i enjoy the fact that i can use a an excel spreadsheet and a, the one that you have is just phenomenal and it's very well developed um but there's something about handwriting out a dive plan that is is really connects me to what i'm about to do and learning to be more efficient in constructing my dive plan and documenting that and translating that to my slates is something that uh, i enjoy and i would like to learn how other people do it and develop my own way to do it absolutely um especially to use the to kind of the the general method on that but as we get into if uh, get into XR, um, I absolutely go through that. The good news is, guys, I, I, I would like to reiterate: uh, um, there's science of diving, there's deco procedures, and um, advanced nitrox, extended range, technical extended range, hypoxic uh, 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 trimix, and hypoxic trimix, right? Uh, yeah. Or technical tr technical trimix and and uh, hypoxic trimix. This course, truthfully, um, is repeated in each one of them, just with a little bit more detail, with a little mm -hmm. bit more detail. So we start with science of diving and then Deco Procedures does the same thing, just with picking up a little, a few different pieces of detail. Advanced range, uh, extended range nitrox and extended range are basically the same course, um, just with a little bit added for to make it XR. Um, and it takes and takes this course again and increases on it and, and gives you more whys. Same thing with technical trimix, uh, technical, uh, technical extended range and up to hypoxic trimix. They take the same thing and they keep adding, adding a little bit more, but it's the same course with a little bit added. So the level that I taught you guys today was probably three quarters of extended range and probably five eighths of uh, uh, technical, technical extended range. So you got most of extended range through this course. So we took it at a much higher level, but I tend to teach it at pretty close to that level to start with um, because um, in the science of diving, you, you don't get the whys, you get the what's, and mm -hmm. I don't do well with, with what's I, I do well with whys. Um, mm -hmm. so when I, I'll be honest, when I took this course, it was very difficult for me because it taught, taught me a lot of what's, but I didn't care because I, I need to know how that applied to life. Mm -hmm. Um, so hopefully you guys got a lot out of it, of the why, and that's really what works for me. Um, so I'm glad you guys had a good time of this course. If you, any of you continue on with, uh, to uh, deco procedures or into XR, 
The good news is with this course, we can cut down the XR down to just basically dive planning, um, dive planning and uh, um, dive composition. So it'll all you guys, any of you need. So um, uh, Caleb, when we do deco procedures, you're going to need one more class um, okay. of deco planning. Uh, and uh, Chase, you're going to need for XR, you're going to need two more classes of dive planning. Okay. And that's okay. that. That's all you need. Well, plus the dives. You have to have to be able yeah. um, with XR, you've got to be able to talk the talk, but you have to be able to walk the walk too. So it's 50-50. Yeah. Well, it's probably more like 30-70 uh, because the, the walk is truthfully the most important person. The math's easy. The I walk is I need to work on. Perfect. We got you there. We get you there. So when we already got a plan, you and I. And so we're going to talk about that on Wednesday. We're going to get you, we'll get those other two classes and we'll get you rock and rolling. I mean, you guys.